Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Drive-In. I am your host, Aaron Lopez, and I am back after a week off. Uh, apologize for missing last week. Uh, but we are back, and this week I've got Ben, who uh, you guys may remember from hosting Winchester uh, about a couple months ago. It's been some time now. Um, you also know Ben from uh, Top Rope Wrestling Podcast, which, after some about two and a half, three months off almost. We will be back next week. Very excited for that. So, uh, Ben, thanks for coming back on. Good to be back. Good to be back. It's a crazy movie we just got done watching. So, this week we are uh, going to be looking at Hereditary. Uh, Hereditary was bizarre to say the least. Um, we'll be we'll be trying to figure this one out as we go through. Um, but it, it just was bizarre. We, we'll get into it here in a little bit. But... Um, some of the details on it, uh, directed by Ari Aster, who I was looking up because it seemed like it was somebody that, that sounded like a name that I was familiar with, not really done anything. He's done a short and this it was kind of like his feature debut, um, got a lot of buzz at Sundance and so that's why we're getting this um, picked up nationally. So um, Ari Aster and then starring Tony Collette, uh, Gabriel Byrne and Alex Wolf, um, also starring uh, as, as Charlie uh, what is her name? Millie Shapiro. So she actually was in um, some stuff on, on Broadway. I uh, looked her up and saw that she was in the original Matilda. So she was not Matilda, but she's got some acting chops outside of this, at least. So, um, But yeah, so we're going we're gonna to talk about Hereditary today. Uh, before we get into that, though, we are going to be looking at some trailers. Um, so let's let's see what we had this week. And I'm actually pretty happy with it. We had seven, one, seven trailers um, and... Four of them, for me, were ones I'd never seen before. So uh, we had The First Purge, Kin, The Meg, uh, Mission Impossible Fallout, Searching, Serenity, and The Little Stranger. Uh, so those seven trailers. Uh, ben, which of those, if not more than one, uh, were you looking forward to seeing? Uh, I'm kind of biased. I'm looking forward to seeing The Meg. Um, I've read all the books by Steve Alton. Um, growing up as a teenager, these, these books fascinated me because they read like the, they, the books read like a movie. Yeah. So they're very easy reads. So, and I think I was telling you before the movie started that I really hope they don't mess this up. It's one of those things where, you know, the book's right there and, you know, they want to make it to a summer blockbuster. That's great. But please don't make it like, I don't know what to compare it to. Like a crappy, uh, deep, deep, uh, what's it called? Deep blue. Deep blue sea. Yeah. 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 All right, it looks cool. Um, I'll be looking forward to seeing it. I always love, I mean, other than Sharknado, which I still think is, everybody thinks it's horrible, but I just, I can't get into it for good or bad reasons. Um, I, I really enjoy shark movies. I don't know why, um, but I, I, I think they're pretty cool. And the Megalodon aspect of this one draws me to it. Yeah, and I, they've been trying to get this made for 10 years now. Really? And I think they were just waiting for the technology to kind of catch up to a, yeah. the CGI because they didn't want to put a, a shitty shark out there. Well, like Deep Blue Sea. Yeah, like Deep Blue Sea. Yeah. yeah. So I think they're mm-hmm. waiting for the technology to creep up and the right people to come up. It's got Jason Statham in it, and he is hit or miss for me. Um, so I was, yeah. But I was not upset with the casting choice of that person. So, I mean, this could be a summer blockbuster. They can make more movies about this because there's, I think, five or six books okay. based on this. From what I saw in the trailer, it looks like a combination of book one and two. Okay. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, you know, if I want something good to go watch just for action, I guess would be the Mission Impossible. Um, this is like, what, the sixth one? Fifth or sixth? I don't know. I, I never got into Mission Impossible. I don't know what my problem was, but I just, I never, I never got into it. I don't know. I'm, I like action movies, but I just, I guess, I never really got into James Bond movies either, so it may be just be a personal thing, but, um, yeah, it, I mean, it seems like it's going to have a decent amount, I mean, if you like the Mission Impossible movies. Yeah, if you're, like if, follows. yeah, if you're into action, yeah, and stunts, and great stunt choreography, and, and then this is your movie. It's got Henry Cavill in it, too, yeah. uh, Alec Baldwin, um, so they loaded it up with stars. I just... I, I feel like when Tom Cruise doesn't have nothing to do, yeah, he just he's does like, another let's, let's do another Mission Impossible. Ving Rhames is in it. I love Ving Rhames. Just watched uh, I Now Pronounce You Chuck and Larry 
and I forgot he was in that. I just I die every time I see him in that. A um, couple of the new ones for me. Searching was new. I hadn't seen. I'd actually just today found that that movie um, existed. I was looking at some stuff and saw that that one popped up. Um, Searching, Kin, Serenity, and Little Stranger were all new for me. Um, Kin, eh, that looked stupid. Basically, um, check out the trailer, but you're. It looks like a a really bad version of like almost like Power Rangers to me. Um, yeah. It's like they tried to make it into like this family friendly or not family friendly. It's not family friendly at all, but like um, a family um, based movie where it's this this adopted kid. I think I don't know. He's he's not part of the family, um, and his older brother gets uh, out of jail, and then he finds a gun from an alien race or something. And then protects people with it and doesn't protect. I don't know. It just, it didn't look interesting. Um, searching did. Searching looks really cool. Searching is basically, I think the whole thing, we were talking about it. Um, I think the whole thing is going to be done on FaceTime. Like, yeah. you're, you're going to see almost like, what was that called? Um, was it Unfriended? There was the one that was basically like the, the video chat. Yeah, on and FaceTime. You saw, yeah. yeah. So, so that's what that, it looks like a, a better version, more updated version of this. Um and uh oh what's his name um oh crap the actor's name from that um i'm gonna look it up here he was in american pie he was in harold and kumar go harold and kumar go to white castle um cal cal pen's the other one um i always forget the other one let's see harold and kumar here cal pen and john cho john cho so, um, he's in it. it. It's weird because I always see him as this younger guy, and now he's got this older, in the movie at least, he's got this older daughter who's in, like, high school. And it's like, John Cho is not old enough to have a daughter in high school, but actually he, he is, so it's kind of weird. Um, but it looks really cool. Kind of yeah. a, a thriller, not necessarily horror, but um, mystery thriller. And I just thought the beginning of the trailer was just in that, that FaceTime on your iPhone mm-hmm. shooting mode. But it looks like the entire movie's done from like security footage mm-hmm. or FaceTime footage or Insta chat footage like that. So there's no like actual camera shots it's done through. It's yeah, it's something that we haven't seen before, um, to this extent. Which like, people but which that's that's new. the thing, people can do that now with their phones. Yeah. People can make films with their phones. Yeah, looking at it, it says the film is shot from the point of view of smartphones and computer screens. It's about a father trying to find his missing sixteen year old da- daughter. Um, yeah, it just, it looks really, uh, interesting just for the, the point of view. I'll be, I'll be checking it out. Um, Serenity, who knows what that is? I, I don't, I'm interested in it, but it also, I've lost interest in anything that stars Matthew McConaughey anymore. Yeah. He, I think this is, I'm recovering from Dark Tower film. Probably. Um, you know, I'm going to kind of go back to what I'm good at. Uh, I think this is his recovery. I think the next few films that you'll see from him will be mm-hmm. very safe films for him because Dark Tower was... are kind of the bed. Yeah, Serenity just looks weird. I'm thinking to myself too, isn't there already a movie called Serenity? No, it's the TV show. TV show. So A good one at that. A good... Yeah, but I was like, that's kind of weird. But, all right. Um, and then the last one, The Little Stranger. This looks really good. Um, Little Stranger is um, kind of like a British... Um, version of Woman in Black. Is that what it is? It kind of, to me, yeah. it kind of looked like that, had that vibe, even though Woman yeah. in Black is a British version of Women in Black. Um, but yeah, just, it had, um, it had, a, it had a couple of people that I recognized. Um, I think no real, like, huge starring anybody. Um, but just, it, the trailer gave me enough to go off of. I'm like, oh, I'm interested in this. But at the same time, I really still have no idea what's going on. Yeah, if you, I kind of, when I saw it, I kind of summed it up. If you like Downton Abbey and Poltergeist, yeah, there, there's your movie. Yeah, it had a very Downton Abbey feel to it. The the wardrobe, the the accents, the actors, um, but just with a bit of a supernatural element to it. And I knew I said had recognized the guy. Um, is it Domhnall Gleeson, the guy who he is in. Um, the Force Awakens, he plays the, the, the major villain. Yeah. Uh, well, not in just Force Awakens. General Hux. He's General Hux in the new Star Wars series. So he looks like a um, kind of a leading man in this. And I'm excited to see what he does. He's a cool actor. Um, 
trying to see. Oh, he was in Peter Rabbit too. That's unfortunate. Um, okay, so Little Stranger coming out. They are uh, finishing that one up, and that should be out here in a couple months. Um, but yeah, so let's let's jump into it because I'm still processing, and I want to see what we th- can potentially come out with in this discussion on Hereditary. Um, so our spoiler-free summary is when the matriarch of the Graham family passes away, her daughter's family begins to unravel cryptic and increasingly terrifying secrets about their ancestry. Um, that is probably as much as we can give you, spoiler-free, because um, there's just so much to go off of. And all these little things that happen throughout the movie are not necessarily spoilers, but they are by the end. So we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, this film had a lot of buzz going in. Like, it built up a lot of buzz real fast. Yes. And then all of a sudden you saw, I've, I've been seeing commercials for it everywhere on every channel. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and sometimes, you know, it's it's hard for a movie to meet the buzz, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, so does this one, I, I guess that's what we're going to talk about, but there's a lot of buzz out there about this coming out of uh, Sundance. Yes. Um, it was Harold, it was, they, they, they thought it was astonishing out of Sundance. The director did a great job. He wrote and directed this. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Well, and for me, I remember... When I went and saw a Quiet Place, this was one of the, the trailers for it. And I'd seen it that day, I think it was. So the trailer for Hereditary came out within a, a, a week or so of Quiet Place coming out. So it's only been about a couple months. But in those two months, it went from being like, oh, this could be a really good scary movie to this is one of the best scary movies of the past 15 years. Mm-hmm. And people are saying all these different things about it. So be interested to see uh, what we come out with. So we will give you guys that opportunity to pause right now. Um you're going to want to see this one uh, just at least to try to figure out what happened. Um, but we'll give you the opportunity because we are going to go into some spoilers. So now is the chance to pause. All right. We are now with only the people who have seen Hereditary because they were really not that interested in Ocean's 8. Or they went and saw it too. Um, but they are here to uh, see what we have to say. Or we're, they're just interested in hearing you and I talk. So um, let's get to it. What... What are you thinking right now overall? You know, we, can, we don't have to jump right into the first elements of the plot. We can just kind of overall uh, figure it out. I don't know what the hell we just watched. Like, it was, it had so much to it. Mm-hmm. And it, it was this, we were talking about before, like this slow, dreading, impending something that we're going towards the end of the film. And um, it didn't let up. It was just like a, an... A never-ending roller coaster of loops and drops, and um, not a lot of jump-out scares. I don't like that stuff because I feel like that's there really cheap. there really were not many of them. But, Even the build-up, yeah. they had a, a handful of build-ups to jump out, but they didn't do it. Do it. They didn't go down that. No. They they actually like respected the script and mm-hmm. in, in the direction of the director. A lot of uh, long shots, long cam- one camera angle shots mm-hmm. to to build tension. Um, and you see that in a lot of more classic horror movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, so well, I'm glad they didn't just want to go like, oh, this is a good place for a jump out scare, which which was one of our big criticisms of Winchester. It was cheap. Yeah. It was just like, oh, we got to put one here, got to put one here. Yeah. Um, this was like nerve wracking. Uh, I mean, there was no letting go. I think for me, the biggest thing with this is, like you said, there there were these long drawn out scenes or, or shots. Um for me, it starts. One of the, the motifs of this is the um, the dollhouse, or just the aspect yeah. of a, a doll, which were all diorama over the house. model. Yeah, and that made its way into a lot of the movie. There were a lot of times where you would see people, specifically Peter, the son, the teenage son, where he would look like he was frozen, like he would just be. You'd get a fifteen second shot of him barely moving. Um, you know, maybe you know a tear building in his eye, or him like slowly starting to react facially, but very subtle and slow, to almost to the point as if it was a little bit of this um, doll situation. It was really weird, very well done, uh, very unsettling. And I think that was, for me, if I give this movie in, in a word, it's just, it's unsettling, uncomfortable. It is, it is very unsettling, uncomfortable. Um, it, it, even that first shot, the first shot, of the, the first thing that pops up on the screen is the obituary. Mm-hmm. I like how they did it. It wasn't like a, a caption. It looked in red like an obituary. Mm-hmm. And then they they go into this shot of a model, and then he zooms in, 
and the model fades into what we know as yeah. And that's what, real that's life. cool. So yeah, the movie starts with this obituary, essentially just talking about the death of Ellen uh, Graham, which is the grandmother. We find out very shortly, um, and we see this room filled with these models. Um, we, we find out very quickly that the mother is a um, creates them. She is being commissioned to create these for this art gallery. And this was, for me, it wasn't necessarily the, the cool aspect of how it looked, almost like we were now in the dollhouse, mm-hmm. but the fact that, like, they had to take a, a room and then make a scale model of it to, and everything had to be in place for this to work. And that was um, a long was really shot, cool. too. It was just almost oh, yeah. like it never stopped, and all of a sudden, you're in the real life. Yeah, dad walks into the, the room, and you really don't see the shift between the model and real life. It It's just... It's seamless. It's really, really cool. Really well done. Um, and so the first thing that we see is we see um, this. Well, and, and that's something too I want to see. Did you catch anything um, with those models in that opening scene? Because I think they gave away a couple things in that opening like pan. I was looking to see because I was like, this is kind of weird. And I always thought like what I thought was going to happen is that it was all fake. Because I, I knew the, that dolls and models were in this, so I wasn't really sure what to expect with the movie. So, like, all these the things that I was playing around with, I'm like, oh, this is going to be, like, the Charlie, the little girl, is playing with things, and she's going to end up killing people in real life because she's playing with them. I had all these different theories going into this. Um, so I thought, actually, okay, what's going on in these dioramas right now? Because I want to see, you know, what was going on. And there was one specifically, um, the... Where the living room was on the bottom of this model, you see something on the floor um, of where the living room is, and there's tables knocked over, or chairs knocked over. I missed that. And I was like, that's weird. And then when it happened later, and you see the the dead body on the floor, and you have all the chairs and everything knocked over when Peter's looking, I was like, oh, they're giving away half the movie without really giving you anything. I would say 80% didn't catch that, because I, I, mean, I didn't even yeah. catch that. I did, they did a good job of me focusing on where they wanted me yeah. to focus. I and I didn't see this, but I I want to know if the telephone pole diorama was in the room beforehand. Yeah, because I'd be curious, like maybe in the tucked away in the back or something. But I don't know. It was cool. Um, I I enjoyed the the kind of foreshadowing there. Uh, but then we get into the funeral. Um, the they find that the little girl Charlie. Um, well, let's, let's kind of establish the family because we're probably going to talk about their names. We have the mother, uh, Ellen, the grandmother, Ellen, who's passed away, whose funeral they're going to. Um, she plays a major role, even though she's not in this movie really at all. Um, we have Annie, the mother, Steve, the father, uh, Peter, the teenage, probably like junior, senior, uh, teenage boy, and Charlie, the 13-year-old uh, daughter. Mm-hmm. So Charlie, they're trying to find out where Charlie is. It's not, they're not really all too concerned, but they're like, did she sleep in her room last night? It's like, I don't know. She didn't. She was in the treehouse. Um, Great treehouse. Yeah, it's a cool treehouse. I was house. like, wow. That's like professionally made treehouse. I was jealous. I mean, there are people that don't have homes that look that nice uh, with that treehouse that they had. There was something. What was it? Um, for me, I thought it was pretty cool. So the treehouse is, um, we see that it's it plays a it plays a major role in the movie. Yeah. Um, throughout, but like for what I thought was interesting is that um, the our first view of it was on wasn't it? It was on the outside. We got this outside view of it. As we go into it, uh, they really don't give you a whole lot of the details. They don't want you to see like the whole thing until we eventually see it at the very end. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just I thought that was interesting. It's like for all the details that we see in every other room, they were ve- being very secretive with the treehouse. They are only. Showing us what they want us to see at that point in moment in the movie. Yep. So, and again, then, and to me, that was done throughout the whole movie. I think so. I mean, that was mapped out. In this shot, we're going to show them this, but we're going to keep this a secret. Whereas, you know, some of the movies that come out nowadays, you can pretty much put together the plot within the trailer. So it was, it was, I was very pleased with how they just gave us little breadcrumbs. Yeah, and, and, and the first major one that we get from the grandmother or about the grandmother comes in the eulogy. Yeah. Um, so Annie is giving a eulogy at her, her, her mother's um, wake. Um, and she is talking about my mother was a very secretive woman. 
it's not a very glowing eulogy. It's no. It's kind of like awkward. Like, I have to do this because I'm the only one that's yeah. here to do this. And she's like, it almost feels like, she, there's a line and she said, it almost feels like a betrayal talking about her now. Um, she's talking about how her mom had all these secrets and rituals. And it's like, to me right away, that line, no one says some, that they have all of their personal rituals. Yeah. Um, that was like a huge giveaway. And there was a lot of these throughout the movie where I was like, okay, well, clearly something's off. But with the fact that she said that her mother had all these rituals, I'm like, oh, so she was in a cult? Like, I immediately was thinking cult. Yeah. Also, the little breadcrumb of where she, right at the beginning of the eulogy, she said, I'm glad to see that she had all these people that I didn't know about come yeah. in to, these new to, faces. Her, to her funeral. And these strange but new faces. And it's like, well, yeah, that's her. You come to find out that's probably the same people that were at the mm-hmm. Into. Well, and I, I know there was one specifically um, outside of uh, Joan, who we find out later has a connection, is the when they're at the funeral, um, Charlie is at her, her grandmother's uh, casket and looks over her shoulder and sees this guy who's smiling at her. Creepy. Very creepy, weird smile. That guy was in the house. Yes. Because we saw him later. Um, and then the one woman went up and put some type of oil... Or something on the mother, grandmother's lips. And Charlie noticed that. And yeah. That was one of the things that never really came back. Like, was, is that, I almost feel like that's kind of a, a tradition. Um, I, I want to say, like, I've, I've heard of people doing that, but I might just be making that up. Like, but they never, they didn't draw back to her, ever. Mm-mm. Definitely the guy with the smile, because his smile was seen later on. Very clear. You weren't going to miss that one. But the oil, yeah, she's noticed that she put oil on her lips. And then, um walked away and no one else noticed apparently charlie very clearly saw it no one else did i didn't know if there was anything to that um yeah i'm not sure um and we kind of start to get the sense that charlie is a little bit odd there's something off with she's, this kid she's a little bit odd uh she has little knickknacks and things that she carries around with her she's really into candy like yeah the, she f- loves first couple candy. of scenes she's eating a chocolate bar she's eating m&ms yep. and uh, just she's just a little quirky. Yeah the the candy. What was the other thing? Because um, that's when they get noticed. Because the dad comes up to her and says, "There's not pe- that's not peanuts, is it?" Yeah. And the mom and I thought yeah. that was cool that they because there's and there's so many different ways you can do this. If somebody has a peanut allergy as a character, you can do it one of two ways. You can you can either go about it the way they did, which is subtle, like oh the kids eating candy, and the mom says to the dad, and he says to Steve, she's like, "We don't that doesn't have nuts." To in me, that would be the more natural yes. way to do that. Not. Oh my gosh, my child has a peanut allergy. Or like slap it out of her hand yeah. or something. Like we're like, okay, you're making a big deal out of it. Now this is going to be important. Um, the fact that they just talked about it the way they did, I was like, oh, okay. Um, very much does become, become an issue later on. Um, but we don't get the telegraph of it at least. Um, but you can definitely tell within the eulogy that there's a strained mother-daughter relationship. Um, and you kind of get that same feeling between... Uh, Annie and specifically Charlie we don't see a whole lot of Peter early on um, uh, but the mother-daughter relationship again between her and Charlie seems to be strained as well yeah back at the so we go from the funeral to back to the house and the the family's coming home and and I think at one point the mom goes up to talk to Charlie and she's very upset by the fact that grandma's not there anymore Mm -hmm. she even makes a comment to who's going to protect me now Mm-hmm. And the mom's like, oh, you're, you're being ridiculous. I'm here to protect yeah. you. And so you, you kind of get a sense that there's, in the eulogy, there's a strain between the grandmother and the mom. And then later, you know, a few minutes later, you get this idea of like, okay, obviously that child was the grandmother's favorite. Um, obviously that child looked more towards the grandmother than the actual mom as a, a figurehead. Mm-hmm. So there's this weird family dynamic going on. Um Again, she's just the, the, Charlie's just a little bit strange with her way of dealing with things and her communication with her parents is kind of weird. Yeah, and I I don't want to sound insensitive to this situation if this is something with the actress, but it seemed like she had burns on her face, like yeah. or some sort of deformity. And I and I actually looked it up to see, and I don't really see that on the the um, the actor. It's a uh, Millie Shapiro. I see like that she may have something with her face, but it really seemed like in the movie it was like drawn out, like her cheeks had some like scars or something mm-hmm. weird with, with her face. Um, but they never really went into that. That was never seen 
Um, I don't know. I, I just, I, I'm looking at pictures of her now and she doesn't seem to have anything major going on. Um, but then you see the bags under her eyes. Um, it almost looks like she's wearing some, some sort of prosthetic within the movie. Yeah. Um, she's different looking. Yeah. Um, we were just having this conversation. Both of the kids don't look nothing like, I mean, I could kind of stretch Charlie and the mm-hmm. mom looking similar. Yeah. Similar facial features or yeah, facial Char- structures. Charlie seems to have a little bit of a, a family resemblance, but uh, Peter looks no. nothing. Like, he, he almost looks um, of Indian descent, um, or, you know, something Middle Eastern, almost. Um, the actor Alex Wolf, um, But it doesn't seem to show anywhere um, anywhere else in the uh, in in his family, um, yeah, I'm looking to see if there's anything. No, he's I mean he's born in born in uh, New York, but um, he definitely has at least some features that kind of resemble somebody at least from um, the Middle East and and darker complexion, darker facial features. But um, you're not going to get that out of Gabriel Burns, who's yeah, you can hear his thick Irish accent yeah. throughout most of this film. So that was, I mean, if I'm going to have any issue with this movie, it's the fact that I didn't buy that that was actually their son. Yeah. I mean, that was weird to be like, that's actually something you're upset about. But it just, it to me, there were a couple times where I'm like, okay, so when are we going to find out that he was adopted? Or like, when are we going to find out? Because it, it was very clear as the movie progressed that, okay, he has, he's important to something, as is Charlie. You know, all these members of the family are very important. Um but it just it just didn't seem believable um, that he was actually. I'm glad, he did a wonderful job, yeah, perfect for the role. But the family setup just didn't seem completely believable. Um, so they get done. We'll, we'll keep going on here. So the the family comes home from the funeral. Um, Everybody's in a weird mood. Yeah, as as they would be. The mother um, died in the grandma died in the house. Um, we yeah. find that out in the obituary. Passed away in her daughter Annie's house. So the mom died in that house. It's the first time after everything has gone on that they can come, they're, they're back, the, the grandma has been buried, and they're going to try to go on with their lives at this point. Um, very quickly, though, we find out that the grave has been vandalized. It had been yeah. like less than a week later, and they say that it had been desecrated. Um, the, the husband gets the phone call, Steve. Mm-hmm. He decides not to tell his wife, Annie, because he's worried about her emotional state. And that makes sense. And, you know, that's what I hope a good husband would do, that he's going to deal with this. That way she doesn't have to. Uh, it's, like I said, it's only been about a, what, a week? Yeah. Um, let's not forget about right after she talked to Charlie, she went up to mm. her mom's room or her room. No, it was mom's room. I'm not sure if it was her mom's room. It looked almost like her workspace. Yeah, but it, it, that's where the boxes was that? were. Okay. The workspace. And she was just kind of going through some of her stuff mm-hmm. and was looking at some things and inside, you know, she found this note and this note was very cryptic, Mm -hmm. but it was basically a note to her in her family, uh, talking about basically to sum it up that, um, you know, sacrifices will be made, but the spoils will be, the rewards will be uh, plentiful, Mm -hmm. you know, like it'll, it'll, this will all work out. Yeah. She like apologized for things not being great, but it'll work out. Yeah. Sacrifices will be made, but, uh, things will work out in the end. And so she's, Kind of feeds into what she was given during the eulogy, mm-hmm. and uh, more secrets. And I thought that, like this is one of the more goosebumpy parts of the movie right here was when she stood up and just kind of heard a noise and looked over in the corner, and it was very well staged or lit or however yeah. you wanted it CGI'd, however they did it. But you see an apparition of us. When she went, yeah, she went to turn. She turned the light off. Yeah, and then she went back and she like looked over and then right in the corner it was yeah just staring at her it didn't it didn't move it didn't you know make a scary face it was just watching her um and you could only see about half of it Mm -hmm. because some of it had kind of faded into the darkness of the room yeah it was like if if somebody was standing in the corner of a room you knew they were there you could see them but you couldn't tell every feature of them yeah you knew that person was there um but she could make it out that it was her mother yeah. Oh, and at this point, this was the first scary moment, I think, in general. Yeah. Um, there had been some unease here and there with some of the situations, but this is the first time that we actually had something off-putting that you, you really didn't have an explanation for. And again, this could have been 
a point where they did some type of jump scare or something like that. But they yeah. just left it to where she was staring at her and the ghost was staring or the spirit was staring at her. And there was like almost a stalemate till finally Annie was flipped on the lights and instantly it was gone. Everything's gone. Yeah. Yeah. I, they did this a couple times. They had the, the, almost the apparition look and I thought it was well done. Um, it was uneasy. There's that uncomfortable. You just don't necessarily know how to react to it. Hell, some of us may have even seen some of these things. Um, before well, we was, hear a lot about a lot of times where people have just recently passed away and family members see what they believe to see apparitions and yeah uh, see, or see a loved one right before they die or something like that so it kind of made to me that's what i was thinking when i was seeing it like oh she's still here or you know well and for me I, yeah yeah because it was that and then okay what was the other there was another moment right after um Almost right after, she goes into her her room, um, and the husband's in there, and they're kind of talking a little bit. Um, and then it goes over, and it shows Peter going to bed. the The father goes in and says good night to him. How are you mm-hmm. doing? You doing all right? And he's like, Yeah, it's fine. So he goes to bed, and then we see a um, a shot from outside, kind of in the treehouse area, into Peter's room, um, because Peter is um, he goes and he's like smoking. Yeah, he blows the smoke outside the room. And then you see breath coming from, yeah. almost like from I was where the camera I wasn't was. The only one that saw no, it. I saw that. Okay. So my question is, who do you think that was? Because at this point, everybody is in the house. There's there's nothing weird going on. So we're giving spoiler. We're like this is. Oh yeah, we're uh, way back. We're okay, we're way past that. So we're, with they've it. they're go- if uh, they're still listening at this point, you're an idea. You, you yeah, I've uh, seen it. I believe it was one of the cult members. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I can see that because, because they're, don't they're you looking remember, for him. I mean, I'm, I know we're this is literally probably the next scene or two, but when. The, when Annie went outside to when when Charlie was following that that light mm-hmm. and she was out in that field and her mom came and got her. It's like, what are you doing out here without your shoes on? Uh, she was watching somebody across the way because they live in this very secluded wooded yeah. area. It's a beautiful uh, shot, beautiful house that they picked for it because um, on the outside the house looks very modern, but on the inside it's got these big hallways and wooden mm-hmm. staircases and door frames. Um, this woman, older woman, was burning something and sitting and doing some type of meditation. Um, so I, I, that led me to believe that, you know, that it was a cult member. Well, and that was the thing, too, is I, I almost thought that she was seeing her grandma. Yeah. Um, and we talked about this before we started, and I, I thought it was oh, her grandma. Oh, in the field? Yeah, in the field where there was the fire and something was burning. Because it was an older woman, white hair, yeah. and we hadn't seen anybody else with white hair in, in it yet. True. So, but I don't know because she had, and that was also too, when Charlie was following the light, yeah. she, so something was going to happen. The light comes into play a few times. Um, it was, it was weird and we don't know. Nothing ever continued with that burning of anything out in the field. There was nothing specifically brought back. There was no callback to that. It was just one of those weird moments yeah. that just helped build up the awkwardness, the the tension of the movie, I think. Yeah. Um, Shortly after this, the mom says she's going out to a movie, um, and she this is kind of a um, an excuse she uses often, apparently, because it comes back later that, that Steve, her husband, says, oh, you're going out to all these movies, and you are the one who did all these bad things. Um, so she uses this excuse quite often, um, but at this point, she's going out to a support group, um, and this is important because we get a lot of, of secrets, um, clues, um, and this is where a lot of the debate for the whole movie can come into play. Um, we get a lot of the family history um, yeah. of the Graham family. Um, it's a, a grieving uh, support group for people that have lost loved ones. Yeah, um, grieving or something. And she's very hesitant about going in. Yes, and even when she's there, she goes to talk once and then stops and then goes into it again. Like and she, man, does she unload? Oh yes, she does it a couple times. But yeah. she's very hesitant to to speak or to to act out on things. But when she does, it is she lets a dumping. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, I thought that was yeah that that scene did give us a lot of information. Um, that that was a, a very clever way, I think, not involving the family, mm-hmm. but just complete strangers. Yeah, and, and sometimes it's the best way is to talk to complete strangers and just un- unload your issues. 
And it's here where we kind of get a sense of the family background and her relationship with her mother. Mm -hmm. And then she also, we find out that she had a brother who, so uh, she talks about how her dad died from starvation. Yeah, because he was schizophrenic. Because he was, yeah, schizophrenic. And he starved himself to death. Starved himself to death. Then we find out that her mom, grandmother that just died, had a dissociative identity disorder, multiple personality disorder. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we find out that her brother was also schizophrenic and he ended up uh, killing himself uh, because he believed that the mother was trying to put some body in him. Yeah, he, he, he had said that he was trying to uh, put people in him. Yeah. Yeah, so it was in the, in the suicide note. That within he, yeah. a span of five minutes, we get this really dark and twisted family background. And it's like, well, if that led me to think, well, what's wrong with her? exactly is, is she the one that just like skips a, gen- mm-hmm. a, a generation or something like that exactly when every single person in the family has a major mental disorder it there's something um and so that was that was one of the things that came out of that for me the other was when she was talking about when she kept it from her mother that she had a child yeah. and then she's like i gave her the second yeah that was really weird the way she phrased that She's like, I gave her the second child because I'd kept, I felt so guilty for not telling her. And so that's where you start to see the, well, okay, so now the mother had something to do, at least partially, yeah. with how involved um, the grandma was with Charlie. And, but she, and she even set up to the point where she was wanting her to, she was, the grandma was wanting to breastfeed mm-hmm. the second child, Charlie. Yeah. And it's like, well, well <laughs> okay. that's a little much. Grandma. Yeah, it's a little much. And, and doesn't that scene end when she comes home and there's a diorama? Showing that one of, um, her, one of her models. Is... No, no, no. That that scene, that diorama was Mine right was after you saw the apparition. Okay, she was uh, con- she was not comfortable. She looked over, she saw it, she turned it around, then walked out the door and shut the door. Yeah, the one thing I think needs to be pointed out because they make mention. They, there's several times they make mention this in the movie. Is that a lot of these dioramas or these models that she's creating, which look beautiful, mm-hmm. very detailed, are Things that are happening or have happened in her life. Yeah. Um, she had one of her mother in a hospice dying. She had one, I believe she was building of the funeral. Mm-hmm. Uh, she had it's one, one of a preschool. One of a preschool. Oh, and the one that you, that you one. just mentioned was uh, her with the baby Charlie in her arms. Mm-hmm. And the mother coming in looking all haggard. And reaching like, out, ha- to, reaching out to yeah. her and having her, her breast exposed to as if she wanted to breastfeed him. Yeah, it was. It's creepy. It, it was it very just, unsettling. You could tell there was something off with the family. Um, every situation that got brought out was just unsettling. There was a lot of things going on. Um, oh. We'd mentioned that there were some things weird with Charlie. That one of her, the thing that really showed her off, um, and it played a big role, was her click. Yeah, she did like the click, the TikTok clicking noise with your tongue, yeah. um, and she she did this, and we didn't know why. Um, it kind of made, gave me the impression that she also had some sort of a mental disorder or something, you know, like she yeah. was a little schizophrenic or, or there was a little bit something going on there. Um, but we, we still, I, they never truly answered why she did that, but she did it a lot. She drew and she clicked. And it was to the family. That was normal. Yeah. That was just like that. Nah, nah, she's normal. That's, that's Charlie being Charlie. Well, the first time we hear it is at the it was when the mother's giving the eulogy. Yeah, and I was like, "That's a weird sound." And then you see it's coming from Charlie. Yeah. The dad doesn't stop her from clicking, but he stops her from drawing. Yeah, which was kind of weird. Which I have a four year old ticks and oh, yeah. stuff is a natural part of a child. Um, usually they come and go, uh, but yeah, that was very, that was very they, yeah. It, it made it seem like the family was used to it. Yeah, like that. That's just what she does, and we were fine with it, and we support her and and all that. Yeah, and it was. It just it, there was again. It was one of those things where there's something weird with the family that there's just an acceptance to. They turn a blind eye, um, and whether or not it's just because it's normal or because they're avoiding it, we don't know. But we do know that eventually, a lot comes out that avoidance and not taking responsibility or not facing something is very much a family trait. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, the next thing I have is the party, but that seems a little too far. I would also, I, I think this is about the point we start seeing about every 20 to 30 minutes of the film, they start showing words uh, written, yes. written on different parts of the wall in the house. 
And um, words that are not actual words. Yeah, words are more like a cult-like, mm-hmm. religious-type words. Um, just scribbled on to, basically, there's the walls. Or the wallpaper. Yeah. There's, uh, the first one I remembered because it, oh, it said Satan in it. It was Satany, S-A-T-O-N-Y. And I was like trying to like play it backwards or things like that i was like thinking of things and nothing jumped out to me and i was just like there was all of these um you saw them come up the first that was the first one then there was another one in peter's room and then two showed up later in the workroom yeah yeah um and then there was a couple others later even too and i can't remember but it was yeah they started just showing it to you not explaining it but saying oh yeah that's there um so yeah i think that now we can go to the party um, at school, uh, you start to see that Peter's, uh, Peter is a really into pot. He's, he has a pothead. <laughs> he is a pothead. Um, he's got some friends. One, you know, with the first text message says, you know, you know, smoke a bowl later. And he's like, yeah. Um, so there's that. Um, uh, and then you have, um, later on it shows that he grabs some off of his, um, his, uh, desk and he's trying to go to this party and it's supposed to be this huge party. Yeah. Um, so he tells his mom, he tries to get the car from his mom, saying, hey, can I get the car, one of the cars tonight? Fibs a little bit, you know. He says it's a school school party, yeah. like a barbecue. And mom's like, oh, yeah, that, I guess that's fine. Take your sister. But she also doesn't completely buy him because she's... Well, says, keep, she's pushing me, you got a drink? You got a drink? drink? You know, at that point, I mean, I know I'm, I'm a bit of ways removed from high school, but at that point, I'm like, yeah, there may be some drinking involved. So it's probably best if I don't take my 13-year-old sister to a high school Yeah, party. and the fact that, that she keeps asking, are you going to drink, but then insists that she takes this, the Charlie along, I thought that was weird. Um, it just, if you had any worry if your kid was going to drink at a party or a Don't let them take the other You kid. don't think the younger one, who apparently was a, a freshman... Um, I think at least kind of you got that. Exp- I mean, thirteen high, seems a little yeah. young though. Junior high because she junior said high. she yeah. Um, so she's young. I'll take your sister. And she didn't even want to go. She didn't. She's like, no, I'm fine. No, I'm okay. And the mom's like, nope, go, go. Which again is a little breadcrumb. Yep. We'll get to to the whole of that later. But then also too, it was weird because um, I think I mean it was it was clear that there was something off with Charlie, but I think that there was at least at very minimum a like a social awkwardness. She just she did yeah. not connect. She did not have the social um, characteristics uh, to really make friends. She had no friends. Almost like if she had Asperger's or something like that, yeah, or some type of uh, um, attention deficit or disorder or something. Yeah, you definitely you felt that. And then all like the mom pushing her, you need to hang out with other kids your age yeah so there's some there there were little like again these little hints that they were dropping that something was off with this kid but again that was it was kind of weird that they never just came out and said it or at least gave you a larger hint you know what we just missed hmm. uh is that when she was at school oh yeah well that, and, that's important and that is very important that is very important so right i think it's a couple scenes before this party mm-hmm. and she's at school she's fiddling around with this toy while taking a quiz yep and and the teacher's like you know go ahead and out of nowhere a pigeon hits the window dies. and and you see it in the trailer yeah and again what i liked about this it wasn't a jump scare you no. saw this bird coming yeah. for like six seven seconds before it finally hit yeah and so it wasn't i mean it, it served as probably one of the quote-unquote jump scares of the movie but it, if you were actually paying attention to the scene it's not a cheap jump scare no which I no. thought was kind of cool. And she seemed to be fascinated by this while all the other kids were startled and scared. It did not phase her one bit. She was actually kind of curious because then they cut to the next scene where uh, she's out at recess mm-hmm. and she has hijacked this teacher's scissors. Oh, and immediately. Immediately. Because it's right after the bird hits the windows, everybody else is freaking out looking at the window and, and saying, she... oh, gross. Her eyes immediately go over to the teacher's desk where you see scissors sitting in one of those, like, pen cups and they and they show it they start she starts sawing off the head of this pigeon yep and then just casually looks around and puts it in her pocket mm-hmm. and walks away well and no that's when she turns around and she sees there's the lady oh, yeah there's so there's this older lady uh, who we don't see well actually i think she is one of the people at the end um but we don't see her specifically in clear light she's across um, the roadway she's, and she's like kind of waving it's not like but definitely staring at her but she's watching charlie yes 
so yeah, there's there's that kind of weird moment, and she does she pockets the um, she pockets the bird's head, which it's like okay, we knew she was a weird kid, but now she's a really weird kid. Um, she takes it home, and she does she makes these little toys um, and like model almost like models, which it's kind of it's kind of a fun way of her doing what her mom does, yeah. but what she can do. She makes it out of basically junk, you know, wires, like, cans, yeah. And yeah. so she makes her own little models, and she's got them all over her room. Uh, but yeah, so she we see, and that's actually what she's doing when she sees the light the first time um, when she goes out to the field. So um, yeah, that was a, a few scenes back. Um, so yeah, she cuts the head off of the pigeon, and um, that that's going to make its way into the scene that we're going to be getting into. So the mom makes her go. Um, Peter goes to the party. Um, insists that uh, Annie insists that Charlie goes. Charlie says, "All right, fine, I'll go." And Peter doesn't put up much of a fight, which is probably the smart thing to do. But at the same time, seems a little unrealistic. You know for... what he's going to do at the yeah. party? Like... Yeah. It seems like he'd be like, "Really? She doesn't want to go. Like, let's not let's not push it." But he, yeah. he does. He just kind of is like, "All right, that's fine. I guess he's not happy with it." But there's really no argument about it. Um, so they go, and this is where. Um, we, we are on this, like, we can start to see, uh, there's some distance between where they live and anything else. Very um, rural. You see, yeah. and I actually found out that this was shot in Utah. Um, I don't know if it was specifically supposed to be set in Utah, but you can kind of see at least, um, that there's, there's a lot of rural space. You got a lot of, um, kind of, uh, unmarked roads, roads that don't have any street lights and, you know, nothing. They're just these, these kind of, um, desert back roads. It almost looks like. And as we're driving th- uh, through, we see they drive past a telephone pole and they f- stop on the pole. Did you notice that the pole had the the yes. thing carved into it, the, the symbol? So the symbol, we haven't talked about this yet, um, but the symbol um, that makes its way into feel, the... Is that the first time we see it? Um, if you're paying attention, no, because you see the necklace that Annie wears has yes. it. And we okay, see that. that. She was wearing that the entire movie. Yeah. Um, so the necklace she's wearing is also the same necklace that um, Ellen, the grandmother, is wearing in her casket. Yeah. Um, but this symbol, it almost looks like a crown. Um, there's three um, specific uh, characters to it, realistically. There, it's, it's hard to explain, but it's this... Looks like a crown with a couple of groovy lines. Yeah, it's just this weird little symbol. Um, it's on this telephone pole, and that's kind of weird, but they just focus on it, and it's not clear... But you can tell that it's been carved into this pole. Foreshadowing. Yes. Um, we we go to the party. Uh, Peter is very much uh, in love with one of these girls. And he's like, hey, do you happen to smoke pot? And uh, he's like, because I got some really good weed. And she's like, yeah, there's a there's a bong in the other room. So he's like, all right, I'm going to go. Um, and he, well, before, before he says that, actually, it's important to see. Um, and in a very weird fashion... Um, one of the girls in the kitchen, just this random high school student, um, is chopping up pecans. And she's doing it very, like, she's chopping the hell out of these things. Um, which was just kind of, I thought that was kind of weird. Um, how she was chopping them. I guess she didn't go to culinary school. No. Um, but she's chopping up these pecans. And then um, it's, like, what, a couple minutes later, Peter's trying to get Charlie just to hang out. Because he wants to try and, he's trying to score with his, his hot lady. And, uh... He's like, oh, no, hey, uh, they're, they're serving chocolate cake. You love cake. And it's like, okay. And I'll be she, back in two. He says, like, I'll be back in two minutes. Yeah, two minutes. And um, Charlie's like, no, they're not serving it to everybody. And um, Which I feel like ties back into your social anxiety disorder type of, like, she doesn't know how to socially go up and just ask for a piece of cake. Yeah. And which, to which he replied, you know, just go up and stand there and they'll hand you one. Yeah, exactly. Like, and he's, he's he's trying to balance being a good brother and not caring, not giving a shit at all about his sister. Yeah. And it's like, eventually he's just like, just you're, you'll be fine. And then he just walks away and she's like, okay. And she goes and eats his cake. And immediately, um, I think we all were like, oh no, there's, there's nuts in the cake. But for me, like, I don't know how we knew that because the the association that clearly was not the batch of nuts she was chopping because this cake is baked at this point. Yeah, but they had a I feel, they had a cake already sliced. Yeah, and you could see some of the the, the nuts, the walnuts okay. or whatever they had yeah, yeah. in it 
Um, so, and again, that was her slice, which... And she... She's, she's just scarfing it down. Yeah, she's eating this cake, and all of a sudden you can kind of see, like, she's breathing a little heavier. She's starting to wheeze a little bit, and you're like, okay, she's going to go into shock here soon. Um, and she takes a while before she realizes. You'd think... There's got to... See, there's all these different hints. She has to have something wrong with her, because if it's a normal 13-year-old, they will know what <laughs> like, it's oh, like. Oh, shit, I just ate some yeah. nuts. Like, if they're starting to feel a little weird about something, yeah. they're going to know. On top she, of that... She, she went and got a drink of water yeah. and was trying to get herself breathing regularly till she finally went and got her brother. Yeah. She goes and gets her brother and she's like, I think my throat's getting bigger. And he realizes at that moment that she's had some uh, interaction with nuts. Um, so he grabs her and uh, runs to his car, takes her, puts her in the back seat. She's starting to wheeze heavier now at this point. Um, and he speeds off trying to get her to the hospital. Uh, we're back on this this road after a short time, and um, she's getting closer and closer to having no breath. She's starting to scratch at her throat. She's kicking. She can barely get any breath. Um, rolls the window down and um, goes out um, the window, puts her head out the window trying to get air, which isn't going to do anything. But again, in that moment, you're trying anything to get yeah. some, some breath. Um, and then we see, I think, is it is a deer or a dog or some sort of animal it's lying dead in the middle of the road. Peter swerves out of the way, um, and as he is readjusting, the pole's coming up, and you see um, Charlie just one on one head hit the pole. Um, and they didn't, they didn't really show you what happened. You just see her head hit the pole. Yeah, and that was it. And Which then I, I would like to know if that was CGI'd or practically done. Yeah, because usually you can tell. Yeah, I couldn't tell. I don't know if that was they actually used a dummy or it was CGI dumb because it looked super real. And it was, yeah. you didn't see the head splatter. You, know. you didn't see, you know, flying off into the air. It was just like, boom. Yeah. Off the head goes and then the body just kind of slumps down into the car. Yeah. Just hang, sitting there. And, and this to me was probably the most, like, impactful scene of the whole movie. Um, there was, a, there were a few moments where you're like, oh, this is heavy or this is rough. Um, but it's like the next two or three minutes, but specifically what happens um, after that, where you see Peter sitting in the car and he's just, he's sitting there, his mouth is open slightly and you see tears starting to, to collect in his eyes. Um, and he like starts to look in his rear view mirror and then like takes his eyes back and he won't, he won't look in it. He looks, he like starts to, and then he, he decides he doesn't want to. Um, and he almost like, he starts to, to say, like, hey, are you okay? Or something. He goes to say something. Yeah. Um, very, very uh, traumatic. Oh, yeah. He's, like, in shock. Um, this is the only questionable series of events for me throughout the film. Okay. The the fact, what you just said, and then he just drives off. Mm -hmm. And then he comes home. Mm -hmm. And he walks in the house. Yep. And you can hear his parents talking in the bedroom, like, oh, the kids are home. That's oh, good, great. they're home. Yeah. And instead of going in there and saying... Hey guys, some sh bad shit has happened. He goes to bed. Well, does he? <laughs> he goes and lays down. I don't yeah, think he, he slept. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he slept either. And then all of a sudden it's morning and the mom, you hear the mom in the back. He, the camera is like just a long shot focused on him. Yep. His he eyes are wide open. Wide awake, still traumatized. And you hear the mom in the background saying, I'm going to go to the store. And she, you hear her walk of the house, you hear footsteps. And then she opens the car door. and Screaming. Screaming. That's the only, I don't know, I don't understand what their reasoning was, I guess, besides being just so traumatically, uh, you know, smacked in the face that he yeah. just couldn't deal with it, any of it. Because he I, didn't even go back to collect his sister's head. No, he just, he just drove, drove away. And came home and went, didn't go to his parents or, I, I don't know. I, I think uh, there's, a, there's, to me, there were two reasons for that. One, exactly what had happened was so traumatic to him. He was trying to save her life, and in saving her, trying to save her life, he killed her. Um, clearly not his fault, but you know it doesn't doesn't matter in a situation like that. I think the other aspect of it is what we find out later is that no one in the family takes responsibility for the things that are going on, um, and so I don't think he could have the if he goes and tells his family what happened. There's something. There's there's more of this idea of um, we lose a lot of the disassociation between cause and effect in the family 
So I think, I mean, specifically as far as a script goes, I think that's why. As far as a real person, I think that he was just so much in shock. And I don't think Peter ever truly recovered. Um, I don't think he ever got out of that shock. No. Because he's like, so slow to react to everything. Because if you're looking at it from the point of he is like so deep into shock that he is just going through the rest of the series of events of, okay, well that just happened. Now I'm mm-hmm. going to drive home because I got to get home. When I get home, I got to go to bed. So it may, it's almost like he was just like going through the motions of yeah what he was originally supposed to be doing. Um. And this is this is a very traumatic situation because the mom then we see hear her crying mm. and she's like just in besides herself we see her in her room literally just can't control herself. Tony Collette did a phenomenal job of this her was, portraying uh, the emotions. Um, you hear her saying, oh, "I just want to die. I can't. This hurts so bad. I can't take it. I just want to die." Um, and, and I was I was holding my wife's hand. That was rough the whole time because I rough. could I looked over at her and I could see her kind of tearing up and just really because it's it's super powerful Mm -hmm. and i mean death is hard but then when you introduce children to it it's like and oh gosh she kept screaming just i just don't want to die now i just want to die now yeah and well and uh, then the the the, um, uh, here we have to add some unsettling nature to it is that we pan from where she and and steve are like collapsing on the floor of their bedroom into the hallway and peter's just standing in the hallway um very stone face again just no reaction no emotion um and he's standing there and then we progress to um the funeral the actual burial um where they're lowering the casket and again she is losing it and everybody else is very stone faced just uh very solemn at what they're doing there um and then we see uh the, the next major aspect of it is that we see um annie saying that she's going to go to the support group again or sorry she said the movies she's going to go to see the movies um and she drives up to the support group because she's having a hard time dealing with this yeah she is it's one thing with her mom at the beginning of the film Mm -hmm. kind of felt like she was like well that's done yeah but you know to lose a child up to the point where she wasn't even sleeping in the same bed like she was going out to that tree house yeah she wouldn't sleep she was not sleeping in bed anymore she uh was going out to that tree house that her daughter had spent all that time in to, to sleep uh just wasn't acting normal <sighs> well and actually the, the family is very shattered at this point oh yeah, yeah. There's, there's it seems like it's just a matter of time um before everything else falls apart for them um it, it they didn't seem to be the strongest unit to begin with um and i and actually um so i misspoke earlier so before we see her go to the support group we see peter come home after having almost like a um a bad reaction to some weed yeah. he's under he's underneath the bleachers with some friends and he starts saying like something along the lines of he feels like he he's having a reaction to something he's getting short of breath uh, he's clutching at his his side um, and then it cuts to him riding his bike home um, and we see that Annie the mom has been sitting in the car sees him standing there so he still doesn't want to go inside the house He's struggling with it. So you can see that there's definitely some character development if he's really struggling with what's happened, doesn't even want to go inside, even though it's I, late I, at night. And I got the I got the the assumption that none of this has been addressed. No. None of it between the mom and the dad and the son and what happened and why it happened and, and all that I feel like none of that has been addressed. No, and you, we definitely know that it hasn't because when she's making the model, she's making a model where you see the car next to a telephone pole a decapitated head sitting on the on the uh, street and a headless body in the back seat where Charlie was and he's like what do you what would you do if if Peter saw this yeah. like he he, it, he you know it would it would hurt him and it's like uh, oh so you guys haven't talked about this you get the impression that that's the first time any of them have ever talked about the fact that Peter was driving the car that his sister was decapitated in yeah like it and i you know i more get, secrets i get that i get that that losing a child would be so traumatic that I guess that would be one of the farthest things off from my mind was to confront my other child about the death of my little child. Yeah. You know, that I guess, I mean, that that makes sense. Uh, I haven't been in that situation. I'm glad I haven't been in that situation, but I, I don't think that, that that, you know, playing 20 questions or interrogating your only child that you have left mm-hmm. would be at the center of the, the list. Well, and so... We do find out perhaps why 
she is not addressing it with him, with Peter, and he isn't. Um, we gotta we gotta kind of jump ahead a little bit to do that. So let's kind of fill the gap. She goes to support group. She drives away after Peter rides his bike and eventually does go into the house. She goes to the support group, uh, but doesn't get out of the car. She's just kind of sitting in the car, thinking whether or not she wants to go. She decides against it, turns the car around, and somebody comes up and kind of waves her, flags her down. Um, she goes and talks to her. It, 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 we find out that it's this older lady. Her name is Joan. Um, she's at the support group because she said her son and her grandson drowned a few months ago, and um, she's been going for the past couple months, and it's helping her. She kind of gives her her information, saying, like, hey, if you need to talk, I'm here. Um, and this is where we start to... For me, there were a lot of moments where things were just clearly happening for reasons. Um, this one was the first where I was like, oh, that's weird. Um, she drives away, but she seems like she's feeling better about things. Um, she, The next time we see her, she is painting... Um, I think it's the... it's. Um, after Charlie has died, she's painting Charlie's room, mm -hmm. uh, the model. She's painting the the Satany word into the the model. Yeah. Um, and then you see her; she's painting this. All of a sudden, one of her paint jars tips over. Clearly, nothing was touching it. It tipped over on its own. Yeah. So that's where I think we start to see some weird supernatural, supernatural influences. Elements. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, nothing, and it just happened to spill right onto that lady's uh -huh. phone number, and uh, so that puts the idea in her head that, well, what's, what harm is it going to do to go and meet with this woman? We yep. have something in common. Apparently, I mean, it's very obvious that she has an easier time talking to strangers about this stuff than her own husband or her son. Which, I can kind of see how that would make sense. Like, the easiest people to talk to about life... Uh, altering situations or, or traumatic events are not people who are going through the same traumatic event. It's someone who knows nothing about it. Yeah. You have nothing to gain or lose from telling this person. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't just feel, we both had this idea that it didn't feel just like some random person. She goes and sees her and immediately looks down at the the mat, which says Joni. Um, and when she gets invited into the the apartment, she goes, oh, my, my mother made uh, mats just like this. Um, and she's like, oh, that's something. And just doesn't, like this. Yeah, it's just passing. Just passing. Chit chat. But immediately to me and you, it, it was like, oh, there's something weird about this lady. Like, there were, the hints were there, um, which I would have to say, like, for me, there were elements of this movie that I felt were very much telegraphed um, as we were going. Didn't know what they were telegraphing. Exactly. But they were telegraphing. Joan was was shady as hell. Yeah. Don't I ever knew trust she an old lady. That stops you in the middle of a parking lot during the night. Yeah. Uh, she is, yeah, you can tell. And she did a great job of playing very nice and, mm -hmm. and comforting, but there's just something off about her. There's yeah. just something, there's an alternative motive going on. Mm -hmm. How that fit into the whole picture, we didn't know. And so when we're at Joan's apartment, we find out more about, um, about Annie, about her past, about her family. Um, and we find that she used to sleepwalk. Um, and, and during one of these sleepwalking incidences, she woke up, um, seeing when, uh, Charlie and Peter shared a room that Charlie and Peter and herself were covered in paint thinner and she was holding matches. She even says the strike of the match is what woke me up, but it also woke up Peter. So at this moment, Peter thinks his mom's trying to kill him. He's, he never recovered from that. And she's also, and this is where she almost gets to breach the subject of, how can I be mad at him for killing, accidentally killing Charlie when I almost potentially accidentally burned him alive? Yeah. And she really keeps saying this, like, I was sleepwalking. And of course, immediately I blew out the, the fire. Like, well, I would never do that. Yeah. But she almost feels like she's guilty, like she was almost going to do that. Like she was in somewhat control. It's, it's, I don't know, man. It's, these, this family has a lot of emotional baggage. I mean, a lot of things that we are not given right up front. You know, we are, throughout this story, we are just given little keys that open up bigger doors to mm -hmm. how traumatic events have affected this family and, and the, the dark history of this family. And because that, I don't know what I do if, if, you know, I got up to get a drink of water and looked into my kids and mm -hmm. there's my wife and the kids covered in paint. Then I was like, I, I yeah. don't know. That's, that's 
extreme sleepwalking. Yeah, I mean, I remember I sleptwalked as a uh, as a kid, uh, and some of the stories my mom told me, and it's it's funny. I never once rem- I never yeah. woke up in the middle of anything, um, and it, it was until I think I was in middle school before I eventually stopped. And you you hear some weird weird things that people do, um, and you know you hear the the I don't know if it's a myth or not. I think it's been debunked, but who knows? Don't wake a sleepwalker, but she she woke herself. Um, and what? Because you always say you'll you'll traumatize them, but she was pro- traumatized when she woke up. Yeah. And so it's kind of like this weird little question. One of the questions I'm going to wait to ask is because Annie's we talk about that in stuff. psychology class. Yeah. And we, we it's you know it's uh, sleepwalking hatchet happens in stage three or four of your sleep cycle. Uh, that is the deepest part of your sleep cycle. So I always refer. I was like, they're not gonna they're not gonna kill you or anything, but just imagine. You go to bed, that's the last thing you remember, and now you've been awoken from the deepest part of your sleep cycle to an unknown place, Mm -hmm. um, not knowing where you are or how you got there. That can be a very startling, disturbing thing to a person. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was very weird. I don't know. But she made very clear that, well, it doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, I don't do that anymore. I don't, it's, that's... I'd have, I mean, I'd have to start time. If that happened, I'd have to start time my wife down to the bed for, for a fear of my kids. Lie. I mean, that would yeah, be a very that was, tr- well, and she, she was even saying I could never, I could never convince him otherwise. So he didn't trust her anymore. So it was definitely a trust issue there. Um, well, that's all but been shattered now that he killed his sister. Yeah. And so now, yeah. The, and so the family <laughs> unit is breaking apart. Um, so at this point, the, um, we see this is uh, Annie is is back and working on things. Um, she goes to the art store, and she comes out of the art store. And this is uh, some time later, but she comes out of the art store and she looks over and she's like, "Oh, hey, and it's Joan. It's Joan. Jones." And what Joan is doing in the uh, parking lot is she's putting looks like chalkboards, yeah, um, into her the back seat of her car in the trunk. And of her she car. is just so excited to see her. She's excited. She's in a good mood. Yeah. And so she explains to Annie that uh, she's going to think it's crazy. She's going to, she wouldn't believe it if it was someone else telling her. Um, but at one of her, uh, one of some, someone had, had told her, hey, there's a medium that um, you need to come and see. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to, to, you know, take care of this and, and just get her involved with this. She's like, eh, I don't want to go. She's like, oh no, it's, there's skeptics coming. There's scientists coming. You need to come to this. So she's eventually, Joan's trying to then convince Annie to go through this seance, go to this medium, uh, or at least come back to her apartment so she can explain it further. Uh, and this actually reminds me of something that um, we we never talked about. There was a very small moment where you see um, the door of their house and in the mail slot. Very a, focused shot. Yeah, there, you the see slot. the mail's in the slot, and all of a sudden an additional piece gets added to it, and it's talking about seances, mediums, call this number. I think it was Joan. It had to have been Joan. Had to have been Joan. Had to have been Joan. Um, but she goes back to uh, she goes back to her apartment, and um, we get this like weird vibe of okay, well, um, we're, we're gonna basically she's gonna do a seance. Yeah, Joan's gonna do a seance. She's got the candles. She's got everything you need to do for a seance. Uh, I don't think Anne's quite convinced. Oh no, uh, but she's doing it to amuse Joan. Yeah, because they. I feel like they, she thinks that they have somewhat of a connection. Yeah, because it's somebody who understands her, somebody she can open up to. She yeah. feels comfortable there. Um, so we've got this really, really weird seance um, scene, but it's pretty much after this seance scene that everything starts to change. So this is a good time for us to take our break. Um, it's probably about halfway through the movie anyways. Um, so let's uh, take a break. Let's go all go to the lobby, refill our drinks, um, go use the bathroom, all that fun stuff, and then we will be back here in a little bit. See what's coming up soon from Eventide. Oprah's Book of the Month Club? Please, we've got something much better in store for you. Let's talk about books. The energy is right. I got a candle going. It feels good. Every Monday morning, Jessica Gillen sits down and talks with you about the very best in books and literature. Murder on the Orient Express. The Strange Case of the Alchemist's Daughter. The Cruel Prince. It's the bookseller. Every Monday morning, brought to you by Eventide Entertainment. 
If there's one thing that's true about wrestling fans, it's how much they like to talk about wrestling. Join Aaron Lopez and Ben Norsworthy for the Top Rope Wrestling Podcast. Uh, Let's get ready to rumble! Tune in every episode and be ringside as these two break down all of the big matches in the world of professional wrestling. Brought to you by Eventide Entertainment. All right, welcome back to the second half of this week's episode. Uh, we had just taken a little break beforehand. Uh, right before the break, we were talking about the uh, the seance. So um, Joan has Annie in uh, her apartment, and she starts to perform this seance, uh, essentially saying that she's already done um, all of the she's already done all of the prep work. Essentially, all she has to do is she's like, put your hand down, uh, <laughs> put your hand down on the glass, but do not um, put any pressure. And then she starts talking to her grandson, saying to the grandson, if you're here, can you move the glass? And the glass moves quite a bit, um, which I thought Tony Collette did an awesome job of portraying exactly how you would react to this. Like, if I'm sitting here and I say, like, hey, so-and-so, if you're in the room with us, move this water bottle. And the water bottle moves a foot to the right. I'm going to jump and freak out a little bit. And she did. It was really – it was very believable. Because, again, she went in being a uh, – not believing, she was to the point of amusing Joan. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, total, total skeptic. And, and both you and I have a, an acting background. Mm-hmm. The the amount of range that Tony Collette has showed in this movie, They've she even needs said, to be on, nominated for an Oscar. They have said that it depends on what else comes out over the next year because we're still a long ways away oh, from yeah. Oscar season again. But a lot of people forget that Get Out came out around this same time. Uh, a year ago, yeah, and it got a lot of Oscar attention. I don't know if it's the movie itself will, but she deserves she, a potential oh. nomination because it was it was phenomenal. And she was just so startled in the scene that, like, she didn't know. It almost felt like she didn't know what to do with herself. Mm-hmm. Like she just. <laughs> so it, as the scene progressed, she just had to get up and go. Yeah, it was a split between being scared and also being a little happy that this was happening because. You know, you realize she, what's the, the first Joan, thing that pops into her head? Yeah, it's it's I can make contact with my child yes. too. And it, the fact that Joan has continued to call it this, he, she is acting as if this is just this little boy who's her grandson. She's just so happy to talk to him again, and it's a positive thing. Um, and she's like, "Oh, you shouldn't be scared." You know, he, it just you know, it's just you know, uh, Billy or I can't remember the name of the grandson, Sam or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's it's really interesting because it she, every time something happens, she reacts but then she almost laughs and giggles a little bit but then you could see fear yeah um it's a weird combination um but eventually the grandson um starts to write on this chalkboard um and writes i love you grandma or grammy or something like that um and at that point it's too much and he's like i can't do this i need yeah, yeah thank you i need to stop i need we need now, to stop this. is this the grandson no, not a chance in this, hell this is a grandson is this what we're gonna eventually i don't get think to? there is a grandson yeah I really, I mean, like, bullshit. I I kind of believed it a little bit at that point. It was still, yeah. I was still kind of, you know, a little skeptical that Joan was actually who she said. But by the end, no, there is no grandson to me. No. Like, there's this was all done to get Annie, yeah, in a certain position. Yep, everything has been them playing with this family. Um, it's nothing to do with anybody else. Um, so this leads us to. Um, this huge, huge fight um, where we start to see a lot more of um, Annie's real feelings, a little bit of Peter's real feelings, um, and they sit down to to have dinner. Um, and Peter, it's it's quiet, it's completely silent. Peter yeah. eventually breaks the silence by saying, "Like, hey, Dad, this is really good," and like they're eating chicken or something, and and, and it's just. And real quickly, yeah, Tony Collette is the star of this, mm-hmm. but Gabriel Burns is the MVP. I mean, he is the rock of this family throughout the whole film. He's the one that's consoling the son. You never once throughout most of the film see any interaction between the mother and son that's in a positive, supporting, Mm -hmm. paternal role. Oh, yeah. It's the father. It's the father that's there consoling the mother. It's the father worrying about her. It's the father that's, you know, talking to the son saying, hey, it's going to be okay. We're going to get through this. So to me... He is like the unsung hero 
of this film because he is just the constant in this. He's the only thing that's okay in this household. Yeah, and because he, he doesn't really show any signs of breaking, while everybody else around him is crumbling down. You can, well, you can tell he's taking on a lot. Um, he's he does break at one point. It's after everything has pretty yeah. much come gone to shit. Um, but he does he does show a lot of signs of he's taking on a lot. He's getting more frustrated at one point. He kind of says it's actually right before this dinner. He says to um, to Annie, you know, you can either. This is when he discovers the she has built a model of the accident. Yeah, and he's like, "Come on, like you can't do this. This is yeah. this is ridiculous." Um, she, you know, he's like, you "Come down for dinner." She's like, "I'm gonna make dinner." He's like, "No, I made dinner. Come down and eat it or not. I don't give a shit anymore. Yeah. Like I just don't care anymore." He is. It, is, it has taken a toll on him. Yeah, he's yeah. he's gotten to a point where he's just not. He's he's the rock of the family, and he is up until really the last little bit of the movie. Um, and he still isn't not the rock at this point. He's just um, kind of just doesn't care. He can't do it anymore to, yeah. um, for the entire family. He just does it more specifically for Peter. Um, and it's during this fight where he kind of portrays that again. He's like, "All right, we're done. This is we're not talking about this anymore." Because um, it gets to a point where Peter says, um, so, you know, "Mom, are you okay?" And she's got the shittiest look on her face yeah while he's the boy because they're sitting across from each other mm-hmm. and he's sitting there eating the chicken and he makes the casual comment to his dad hey dad this is pretty good mm-hmm. and she has just got this nasty disdain look on her face she's pissed want him to pretty much choke on that chicken uh yeah and and it's after he says are you okay she's she starts like well what why would i not be okay like and it's like they're toying about no one's really trying to say anything. Yeah. And it builds up and builds up to them kind of just being kind of passive aggressive until Peter says, um, well, just fucking say it. Uh, and then she snaps. She's yeah. like, don't you cuss at me. No, never curse at me. I'm your mother and this and that. And then she this unloads. This is an intense monologue. Yes, this is a very intense monologue. Um, to which point I almost thought that she was dreaming it. Because to the extent of both Steve and Peter aren't saying a word. They were taking it. Peter has literally stopped moving. Yeah. His mouth is open a little bit again. He's in one of those trances. And I almost thought, like, she just snapped on everybody, and she didn't actually, he didn't actually say anything to her. Um, but, again, she, it, it didn't play out that way. Um, but she talks about how no one in the family ever takes responsibility. He's like, you know, your sister is dead. She's gone. And I know it was an accident. I know you miss her. And I know you loved her. And, and I, I wish I could take this pain yes. away from you. And I wish I could do this and protect you. But I can't. And and he even and she even says, but you could have at least said you were sorry. Yeah. So, again, no one has even addressed the fact that he was driving the car, yeah. that he did this. You still um, have, it's, it's, it's like, yes, we have two injuries uh, let's deal with this broken leg, but let's not. You're forgetting about the gaping gunshot wound, exactly, and you're bleeding out, and we're not. You're not even addressing that because you know it's almost like I, for, through half of the mo- part of this movie, I almost like is she forgetting that she does have another child? Oh yeah, yes. The, the, he was involved in this horrific thing, this accident, which w- it's what it was, um, but it's like she's forgotten about him. Yeah, and it's like yes, I would have a, it would be a hard pill to swallow, and but eventually, you know, as a parent, I would have to go to my other child. And like, I need to know that you're okay. Mm-hmm. I'm not okay. You're not okay. But we have to get through. I mean, that's a normal family dynamic, but this is not a normal family dynamic. Because no, not of at all. all the, the history. And it's after this fight that we get a lot more family history and yep. we get a little bit more of this weird um, aspect of the, the film. So she goes on this big rants and she sits back down at the table. Yep. And he makes the comment, uh, is this where you're going to go? He makes the comment, of, well, you know, I know that I was there with her when I was driving. He says, what about you? But what about you? Mm-hmm. And she's, again, she gets this shitty look on her face and she's like, what do you mean? She say, "Oh yeah, because he says that um, Charlie didn't want to go that night. You made her. So basically, flipping it of saying, yeah, I didn't say I'm sorry, but you didn't either for making her go. She would never have even been in the car with me that night had you not forced her to leave the house. Yeah. Um, and so we start to see this. I mean, she and she stands up and she's just like, I, I am done. 
um, because the father, Steve, says the dad has we to are break it up. So they, she goes to bed. Um, Which he did a really good job of portraying that because every once in a while they would cut to his picture and he's just sitting there like biting his lip like how long or how yeah. much longer should I let this go on he's, he's the ref in a hockey fight yeah he's like yeah they need to kick their, each other's asses for a little bit to get better because this get is this probably out. the most communication they've had since the child's death I'd, I'd even Yelling say since Charlie was born because after that it was a little weird they yeah. said yeah the, the definitely since the death um, so he yeah he's letting them duke it out it's of such it. a hard position to be in yeah, and there are times where you can tell like he's like, oh, that one hit below the belt, yeah. but he's not going to say anything. It's not until they've both accused each other of being the reason why Charlie has died that he finally steps in and says, okay, this is, we're done. It's almost I'm like not a, a grievance intermission, uh, intervention. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, yeah, some harsh things are going to be said, but that's the only way to get it out. And that's exactly. the only communication that's happening between this family right now because she's not communicating to the husband. She's not communicating to the son. Mm-hmm. She is just dealing with. She's boxed herself yeah. off. Only person she's communicating with is Joan. Oh, so. Joan. Um, so yeah, she goes. She goes to bed. Annie does, and um, she wakes up. She can't go to sleep. Um, Real quickly, you know what? I the last thing I like about that scene. Yeah, is is they they pan out. She walks off. They pan out, and Gabriel Burns is sitting there, and the son's sitting there, and Gabriel Burns just kind of reaches mm-hmm. over and. You know, mm-hmm. pats him on the arm a little bit, like, "Hey, this it's it's gonna be okay. I'm here yeah. for you." And then he, and this is just the little things I appreciate in films. He cuts a piece of chicken, and goes to almost eat it, and mm-hmm. just like everything that just happened was so painful and disturbing that, like, he almost bites the chicken, and then he, he just can't he, eat. Can't eat it. He's like, is like, I've lost my appetite. Yeah, I, I just I, that, I appreciate those little things. Yeah, but they put it no. I, I saw that too. I like that. That was they, there's a lot of little subtle nuances uh, that they just portray have, reality. Yeah, they yeah. just could have pulled back and left it, them sitting there or patting them on the arm or whatever, mm-hmm. and there's a cut. But it's like that was so hard to deal with that he, yep. he totally lost his appetite. Yeah, I think that it's. I mean, it's it's going to be an interesting. Um, it's going to be an interesting Oscar season next year for but, many reasons. But, but I really feel like. I really feel like they they may potentially get a little bit of attention just because of how well it was done. The fact that Get Out actually got so many nominations yeah. and won a handful, yeah. um, I really think that it could. And because of you know those little things that you mentioned, um, it could it could get some attention. I think and it deserves it at this point in the it's season. It's about time. They're, yeah. they're, they're, for years, the Academy has has not really looked at the horror genre. Mm-hmm. Outside of Silence of the Lambs, yeah. yeah, I mean, the Silence of the Lambs would probably be the last one. Mm-hmm. Um, that that there's not all there. There are few among few, but horror, certain horror films out there. There are performances out there that should be looked at. Yeah, I mean, Get this Out could be is another, a great this example. And definitely this one is could be one, one of them. Um, so as, as she goes, as Annie tries to sleep, she rolls over a couple times and finally. Um, closes her eyes and opens them one more time to see a couple of ants um, on the um, on her pillow, which we have seen ants before. The last time we saw ants, they were covering Charlie's decapitated head on the side of the road. Um, which was, that had to be, that was practical. Yeah. That looked great. Yeah, it was very well done. Because it was almost like, and I, it, t- did it feel like that they made that scene feel like the next day or the day later? Because half With, of her face was already... Yeah, it had been. Well, Shoot I mean, had, it had been a, a day or so. Yeah. Um, at the same time, though, too, if you have no blood coming to a um, a body part, it's going to start to decompose fairly quickly. There's going to be. There's nothing giving it life. There's nothing. Yeah. So the decomposition is probably pretty quick. Because um, part that of it quick, didn't look uh, like her. Yeah, it, it, it was very disformed. Yeah. So she sees ants. She goes and she sees ants. Um on her her blanket and then actually sees a lot of them coming in through the crack of a uh, like in the window um and so starts she starts to follow them and she follows them into peter's room of which point she sees peter completely covered almost um well and and has ants coming out his eyes his mouth everything disturbing very disturbing um sequence and um she starts to like scream um without any sound coming out and then we hear peter saying mom what's wrong and she's standing at the foot of his bed. He's sitting up, and she was uh, sleepwalking and yeah. dreaming the whole thing. 
Um, and, <laughs> and all all those memories that Peter had traumatized as a child starts flooding yeah. back into his mind that, oh shit, she's doing this again. And he asks her, he's like, why are you afraid of me? Like, why are you so afraid of me? Like, what is wrong? Why can't we have a normal relationship? And she's like, I never wanted to be your mother. And then immediately grabs her face. Like, yeah. why did I just say that? Um, and the floodgates come open. We start to find out some more things about this family history, um, about how she tried to have a miscarriage. She didn't want to be a mother. She was afraid of being a mother. Um, and a lot of it is because of, she didn't have a good mother as, yeah. a, as an influence. She all, didn't know how all, to be a mother. All of that could be tied back to her mom. Yeah. Um, she said she tried everything to miscarry. Nothing worked. And she's glad it didn't. Um, at this point, we, we go back to Peter. And Peter's sweating profusely, it looks like. Um, and then we go back to Annie. And then I realized, okay, it's not sweat. I thought he was. Um, and she's got, she looks like she has got just been hit with a, a gallon of water. Um, and so you can start to see like, oh, this is another dream. Um, and it's a paint thinner yeah. concept. And um, then he, without them showing it, starts to burn alive. Um, and she freaks out again and wakes up. So she dr- she inceptioned herself. She, she dreamed within a dream. Yeah. Um, which is weird. That doesn't that only happened that one time. Um, but, but again, the, it goes back to these are her subconscious thoughts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, which, that for me, I was like, like you just said, why the hell is she saying that? Yeah. <laughs> like you just scared the shit out of your son. Exactly. And then all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I didn't really want to have you. Well, and that this this is the moment where I start to wonder, because she is saying and doing these things, um, is that when she slept walked to um, all those years ago with the paint, uh, the paint thinner scene um, that we talked about earlier, was she really sleepwalking? Like, I think, like, maybe she was, but at the same time, I think there's a little bit to it where she also potentially didn't want to be a mom. She didn't feel like a mother to Charlie, and she didn't want to be the mother of Peter. So potentially, a lot of my my thoughts at that point went to she could be actually going to kill her kids. Um, And again, we talked about from the family history that there's some schizophrenia. There's definitely some mental illnesses in the family. She easily could have. Yeah. Um, so and again, you get chunks of it here and there. Yeah. Everything's just not thrown at you once, and you have to kind of decipher things. You get important pieces of information throughout the script. Mm-hmm. And it's it, that's what makes it. You just unlock another door, and yeah. you keep going deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole. Yeah. Um. So at this point, she we see her. Um. It's actually she's woken up now, and um. She is in her bathroom speaking a different language. She is performing her seance, she, or she's starting to at least. Um, the next thing we see is she is over top of Peter. She's kind of like like waking him up. She's like, hey, I'm really sorry. I never, I didn't, can't believe I said all those things. Um, she goes and she tells you know him, wake up. I can fix this. We're, we're going we're gonna to be okay. Yeah. Runs to Steve, says the same thing, pulls him downstairs, at which point you see that she's she has a candle set up. Set up. Yeah. Yep. She's got the whole uh, candle set up. Uh, she's got. Did she have? She had the book. She had the sketchbook. Yeah, Charlie's she, uh, sketchbook. Yeah, she had the little black sketchbook, and and which kind of surprised me because I and I think this plays on a little bit of how she was how the whole entire situation was wearing on Steve. Yeah, because he was not receptive to this. Oh, he he thought he's this been was just very another, receptive yeah. throughout. You know, her going and sleeping in the in the. In the car, or her going sleeping in the the log the little uh, log house that they built for the kids, mm-hmm. he's been very supportive. Yeah, he was. And dealing I think with this is where he kind of is like, I can't do this shit no more. Yeah, he like, even says like when as soon as she mentions something about a seance, yeah, he, he's like, oh for fuck's sake, like he's just he can't do it. He yeah. cannot handle it. Um, I mean, I mean, I don't know how you would feel being woke up in the middle of the night with your wife saying, look, I want to do the seance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, so at this point, then you would be a little concerned, and that's you see that concern on both Steve and Peter's face. Peter buys into it quickly, though, as soon as he finds out that it potentially could be a way to talk to Charlie because he is feeling and guilty. Also, a way to talk to his mom. Yeah, she <laughs> seems if, like things yeah. are going. She's like, "Oh, this is fine." Like she seems more. This like This is going to bridge herself. the gap between us. Yes. Um, Steve doesn't want any part of it. He eventually does it, though. Um, at this point, they all put their hand on it and on the glass, very much like in Jones. And she says, Charlie, if you're here, um, 
you know, move the glass just a little bit, and it goes like three feet across the table. Mm-hmm. It almost flies off the table. Um, at which point, the um, you see Peter is freaked out. He's like, he's not liking this at all. Um, Steve is trying to wrap his mind around it and understand what just happened. At which point, um, she opens up the drawing uh, book, the sketchbook, and asks Charlie to continue doing what she saw her doing earlier. Um, and at this point, too, I almost they never showed what was drawn earlier. Um, they should, there's later onward, there's all the pictures of Peter, but that's, that's yeah. after. But she's it, expressing to her husband, like she was doing this like 20 minutes ago, Yeah, but she holds it up and you kind of can see it. It looks like the car. Yeah. It looks like a drawing of a car. And that would be really like dark if yeah. they showed that well, the drawing that she drew was the car she died in. Um, cause that's what it looked like. And I, I don't know if I just saw something that looked like a car and so I'm making that up, but I swear I saw that car, which almost was like a drawing version of the same car that they did it. Um, but at this point, we, we Steve slams the book shut because nothing's happening. He's like, "No, it's not. We're, you're 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 scaring your son. This isn't this isn't okay." Um, you, and while all this has happened, this. Peter is somewhat distracted by something going he on. He hears something. He hears something, and he the, he knows. I, I get a sense that he senses that there's something not right in the room. Yeah. Um. You know, this is maybe getting a little bit out of control. While mom and dad are sitting there arguing about whether to continue this or not, and and the mom's pleading with the dad, saying like, "I just did this 20 minutes ago by myself, and mm-hmm. it worked." And she's communicating with us, and dad's like, "Ah," oh, in this thick roguish irish yeah. accent like oh fuck this shit we're not He's doing this it, yeah. you're scaring your son uh and this has got to stop and then all of a sudden the this glass cabinet shatters and at that point she's like they're all a little concerned they yeah. okay this isn't and she's like even like charlie like are you okay are you upset and um then the fire of the candle um like shoots really up. it shoots up like a like there's like gas was just put on it and then goes out and then comes back on again. Um, and at this point, you, you, Steve is looking underneath it. Like, is there a gas pipe? Like, what's going on? Like, what are, what did the hell just yeah. happened? And you hear this groan start to come from Annie. Um, Peter's still very much afraid. Um, Annie starts talking like she's Charlie. Yeah. She starts talking like she's a little kid. Um, Peter's freaking out. He's like, Mom, you're scaring me. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Steve runs to grab a glass of water. He splashes her and turns the light on, splashes her in the face. And she's like, what just happened? What's going on? Um, at which point, Peter ugly cries into Steve's shoulder. Like, yeah. he loses it. And one of the things that we haven't mentioned yet that I love about this movie, and you just brought it up in this scene, is they use common sense. Yeah. A common sense thing what to do would be... To turn on the lights mm-hmm. and go get something to get her out of this trance. Even we see too much in horror movies today where they do the exact opposite of what common sense is. Oh, let's just walk around in the dark here because mm-hmm. it's totally okay. It, it, this movie had a lot of common sense things that people would do or how people would act in this film. Yeah. I mean, to me, that's what would be the first thing I do. I'm flipping on some lights. I'm getting a glass of water and I'm chucking it in my wife's face to bring, try to bring her out of this yeah. trance. And she does. She comes out. And she's like, "What happened? What's wrong?" Um, and at this point, they they're they're just done. Now, my question to you is: Do you think that actually was Charlie, or do you think that was a demon, Paymont? That we find out a little bit later. Well, that's that's. I guess that's the overall one of the biggest questions of the film is is was it Charlie the whole time, mm-hmm. or this this entity, this this demon that we're going to be introduced here in a few minutes to. That is really kind of what the grandmother was focused on throughout the film. Um, I don't know. I had a very hard time in this film deciphering what or who they were communicating to. Um, Yeah, and that's the thing too is the question is, is Charlie possessed from the beginning of the movie? Was she ever possessed when we saw her? You know, what happened? So, yeah, I'm not sure. I have a feeling that it wasn't. I, I even have some theories by the end of the movie that I don't think everything's happening the way that we see it so we'll talk about that but i i think charlie's dead and gone i don't think she ever comes back um but it's that but that's the thing we, and we were talking about during the break that you know I, i've read this book called demonology by ed and lorraine warren who's famously connected with the aim of the horror and uh some other famous hauntings in america and overseas and one of the things that whether you believe in it or not one of the things they talk about in the book is how what a demon likes to do is to trick people 
mm-hmm. and a very popular way to trick people is through seances or the you know, Ouija board. Um, they like to trick people into thinking that, oh, we're contacting this loved one. I'm contacting Charlie. Charlie just moved this gl- uh, glass across the table. We are definitely, you're pretty much, in his case, he was saying in the book that you're inviting this entity yeah. into your home. Which begs the question, was that entity already there mm-hmm. with all the writings of the words on the walls that we see throughout the house? Yeah, and I and, and with the potential something? cult aspects of it, yeah. like, had they been there before... Um, this is something that the grandmother conjured up. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that. I don't know. I, I I I have trouble figuring out that. Well, and it's it's after this moment um, with this seance uh, at the Graham family home, things start to get weird for everybody. Um, more specifically, you see Peter um, at school. Uh, I think it's the next day or within a couple days, and he's out of it. He's tired. He's he's lost it like again all of these horrible things have happened mentally and emotionally he's gone i would feel like you'd a responsible parent would have like my kid's not going to come back to school for a few weeks we yeah need, we need to get away or we something we're going through something because he here. looks like shit yeah he has been through the ringer mm-hmm. several times and and this is where you see if you've seen the trailer you've seen this specific moment um but it is it's when Peter looks into the – well, he sees the light first off. Um, and he looks over into the reflection of this glass cabinet and he sees himself but smiling. And he's not smiling. Mm-hmm. Um, at that point, he freaks out and stands up because he's, he's scared. Um, and he goes out and walk, he says he has to go to the bathroom. Um, his dad then comes and picks him up because the mom has uh, decided that she is – not going to, or the, the dad says, hey, have you, do you know who just called me saying that they are afraid and tears? And he, she says, Charlie? And he's like, what? No, Peter. Yeah. Uh, Peter called me. He's afraid something is following him and is threatening him. At which point, she think he's making it seem like it's her fault. She's upset. She hangs up. Um, oh, and, he hung up on her. He hangs up on her. Because he was like, we're done with this shit. We're done. And I then don't... she calls him back saying... Yeah. Don't hang up on me. Don't yell at me. It's my Bubbles. child too. Yeah, and then she hangs up on him. Yeah. The phone rings again, um, and she lets it go to the answering machine, um, and it's the the museum that she's been building these models for, saying like, "Hey, we know a lot has been going on right now. You're probably not in the best mental state. Is there anything we can do for you? We're praying for you. You know, we're you're in our thoughts. Um, if not, can you give us an update? And what model was she working on when that called? It looked like a like a banquet hall, like yeah. almost like a, like, like a place. Chandeliers, some she was working called, with a chair. A lot of chairs. It looked like maybe there would be like a speech given there or something. And yeah, so she she's built making this. It wasn't the funeral home, was it? I don't think so. It looked too big. Yeah, like the funeral home only had maybe like six or seven, eight okay. rows. This looked like it had like twenty five, thirty rows. Room. Yeah, larger room. Um, so she's building this, and she kind of uh, she gets really tense, and she breaks one of the chairs. And then she snaps. She starts breaking this model. Um, and the next thing we see is the son, uh, Peter and Dave, uh, Steve, have come back. They walk right next to it. And you see she has destroyed her entire gallery's worth of models. Um, and it's interesting because as soon as Steve walks into the, the house, he goes, what's that smell? He says he notices some sort of a smell. And he even comes into the room saying, like, hey, what do you smell that? You know, what is that smell? And then he notices the models realizes that she's kind of snapped he's not upset with her um he was like it was bound to happen yeah. sooner or later he kind of realizes that he definitely was it was fine because every time that that they there was some type of emotional outburst or event going on she would go back to her work mm-hmm. she was, it was constantly her of her avoiding avoiding yeah she would go back to the work and um and at this point that after she mentions or hears steve mention about this potential like threatening force um, she's, she is, is starting to think about this. Um, it's after she starts hearing these sketching sounds, she goes up to Charlie's room and sees something is drawing and drawing and flipping the pages and drawing in this sketchbook, um, that she finally like goes up, grabs it and, uh, goes to the fire to, to burn it. She's like, I'm, I'm, she's trying to, to stop yeah. this. She thinks and that there's a way away were, from it. There were pictures of what I appeared to see as the sun. They were, no, they were Peter. You yeah, could see because of the Peter. mole. 
Yeah. Because he has a very distinct mole above his lip. And so, they, yeah, they had the same And just, and did look. you notice how the eyes were X'd out? Yep, all the eyes had been X'd out yeah. um, in each picture. And, um, yeah, and, and so you see that. And so she goes and she takes this. She goes to put it, she decides that she's going to put it in the fire, but she's res, you know reserved. She's not sure if she wants to because it was her daughter's sketchbook. Um, and it, she feels like it's her only connection still to Charlie. Um, but she eventually throws into the fire. And as soon as it catches fire, so does Annie. Like her a, arm, her yeah. arm catches fire and the bigger the bigger the fire gets of the sketchbook the bigger the fire gets on her arm so she takes this to believe as she says later hey i'm connected to this it's as i should be because i'm the one who said it she's like i i made a deal with this thing now whatever it is and i'm sorry and she's trying to apologize for it later on we'll get to that in a little bit but she eventually pulls it out puts out the fire and um, realizes that it's not going to be that easy she can't just be done with it um which then leads her to... She goes back to Jones. Yeah, she goes like, back to Jones. I need some help. Banging on the door. Joan, Joan, I gotta talk to you. Joan's not home. We find we know where Joan's at. Joan's at school. She will be seeing her in a little bit. Um, but we do see the inside view of the house, of her apartment. It kind of pans from the door through the hallway and to the table where they had their conversation. Several candles lit. A lot of candles, a lot of sheets kind of hung up. And on the table, a triangle like carved into the table with Peter's picture in the middle. So some sort of a demonic um, ritual. Uh, ritual that has been has happened with Peter there as the um, central force. So then we go back to Peter, um, and Peter is in the uh, kind of the... Um, courtyard. Courtyard, yeah. It's kind of this outdoor area. There's kids playing um, soccer and eating lunch and just kind of hanging out. And she starts hearing someone yelling her name, or yelling his name and saying, I... Um, I Oh, what'd she say? I didn't get where this... I, I didn't understand how this scene... So what was she doing? She was trying to... Oh, she, that's what it was. I expel you. She was trying to expel Peter from his own body. Because at this point, remember, we, we well, very shortly after this, once she... Um, re, once Annie leaves Jones, she goes back home. She starts looking through her mother's stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's where she starts to see the connection of Joan knew... Um, her mother. She's got one of those old school 1980s oh, yeah. picture albums where you put the picture in and you put the laminate over yep. the top of it. And there are several pictures of her mom and Joan hanging out together at, at parties, yep. um, doing some ritual. Yep. And this is also where within that one of those books she uh, finds out about um, King uh, Paymont, yeah. who is the um, this, this potential, uh, well, one of, we find out, one of the rulers of hell. He's one of yeah. the kings of hell. And so underneath that, you find out that in order to summon Paimon, you have to find a vulnerable male host. So they have to find a... He is the male form. Yes. So therefore, the, uh, it would make sense to have another male form. And that's where I believe they were... She was... Joan was trying to... Exp- she thought that he was vulnerable enough. She thought yeah. at that moment he was ready to be expelled and have Paimon come back into um, his Peter's body. So I think that's what she was doing. Um, he was very much taken back by this. The next scene is him in his classroom um, and just, I just he's thought, lost it. I just thought, to me, the way I read that scene and based on what I've read, that that I don't know if the transition of him being possessed had already started. And, and she was, I don't know, doing some kind of juju magic to get Pavon to inhabit the mom for a little bit to alter the plan i'm not sure how that i feel like at some point in the movie that he was starting the the process of being taken over i think so i mean they've been playing with him the whole time he was clearly their end game yeah um Peter which was goes back one. to what she said about i never let mom near mm-hmm. him i kept him away and then finally when charlie was born i let her near and Charlie even says, Charlie uh, had said uh, earlier on that Grandma wished I was a boy. Yeah. And she's like, oh, why do you say that? You know, like, she's not sure, um, you know, why she said that. So, yeah. now we know. Um, so, we, we start to see this this kind of weird thing happen again with Peter. He's sitting in the classroom. All of a sudden, um, he starts feeling uneasy, and you see the lights again, and his hand... Um, he looks like he's having trouble breathing or like he's like holding his breath and like trying to like put all the blood to his face. Very kind of contorted. Yeah. 
he puts his hand up, um, and he does it in a way that is um, really, really weird. Um, it's this idea of um, he's almost putting his hand up, and his at his wrist, it's like a ninety degree angle. Yeah, and it's very rigid. Um, you also see that almost looks like someone's like pulling his arm almost up and holding him like by a, like the ear, like a marionette or something. Yeah. like that. and then his head slams into the desk. Very and it violent. Stays there. <laughs> and it pulls back again, slams again, and at that point, then he like breaks the spell, breaks his hold, um, and he's freaking out. And he's losing it, and everybody's sitting there watching him, um, sitting bleeding from. He's broken his nose. He's sitting there on the floor bleeding, um, and then we jump back to what we have seen from Annie because a lot happens. This is a very big moment. Yeah. Um, Annie starts to, um, she, she decides that she's going to go up into the attic. Um, and this is when she pulls it down. You see all these flies. And so she looks up in the attic and yeah, she goes to her mom's room. Yep. She goes through that stuff. She finds similar, uh, a doormat. Door, yeah. The welcome mat. So and then she connects it and then she connects Joan to her mom and then first, did they give her? Was it because of the flies? I don't think so. I think she was, she, going was up, like, she was going up to the attic to find something. I think. Maybe her mom had more stuff up there, and the, the attic was just the natural place to go. But as soon as she opens the attic, whatever the reason she was going up there changed because yeah. a bunch of flies come out, and so she climbs up, and there's flies all over this attic. She does the very. This is one of those cliche moments, but she does the cliche flashlight around the entire attic, and then the last spot that she you know, sees, she sees feet laying on the ground. She approaches it very slowly and it's a decapitated body that has been rotting. Um, above the body is the symbol yep. that we've been talking about. The necklace from the necklace. Yep. And she dry heaves and she gets all, you know, she's getting sick cause there's this body. And, um, then when Peter and, uh, Steve come home, it's one of the first things she helps get Peter back up into bed. And then she's like, you've got to go up to the attic and see yeah. there's something up there. I think it's my mother, my, my mother's, uh, dead decapitated body and steve is starting to put at this point steve's done oh he dad yeah. dad is done he's done uh even the scene before he has an emotional breakdown like this is the first time we actually see him cry yeah because like now his son is sitting in the back seat of the car his nose is busted open yep his wife has gone nuts i could think there was a scene a short scene before that where he was sending an email to like one of, I, I assume that he was a psych- a psychologist or something and he was it sending seemed like a, that, yeah. And he was sending an email to a friend saying, "Hey, I think my wife is on a verge of a mental breakdown." I think it was the um, the gallery. Yeah, he's like, oh, "Was it the gallery?" I thought he was okay. emailing the gallery saying, "Like, she's either going to through something or is in the middle of yeah, a, a in the mental middle breakdown." Of so he realizes that shit is sideways. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we see him have an emotional breakdown. They come in. The mom quickly approaches him. She starts freaking out because her son's hurt. She's like, mm-hmm. "What happened?" And he's like, "Just." Grab his legs. We'll take him inside. Uh, they they go upstairs. They lay him down. He's unconscious. He's just, he's out. Yeah. Um, and then that's where we pick up where she's like, "I need you to go up in the attic." And he's just he's just like he gives her this look of like, "Not this shit again." Why? Why? You know, what, what? What's what, in the yeah. attic? Um. And so he goes up there. She is going down. She goes down to um. The to start making this fire. And as she's making the fire, you hear him start to scream. Mm-hmm. He comes down the the, uh, the attic's ladder, and he's like, why didn't you call the police? What is that up there? And she's like, I think it's... And she, like, dumps on him again, saying, I think that it's my mom's body. I think that, um, you know, Joan, the person I was telling yeah. you, she knew my mom. She she's showing all him the things. picture book. And so, all, so she knows all these yeah. new things about her mother. And she's trying to, like, convince him. But on the other hand, I see him in his mind putting together two by two because he's the one that's been dealing with the cemetery people Mm -hmm. that the grandmother's grave was desecrated and and dug up. And so he's putting two to two together like, okay, you done gone off the deep end. You're the one that has gone there. He's like, did you, you, did you, you, um, did you unbury your mom? Did you, did you dig her up? And She's like, what? What are you talking about? And at that point, then, she finds out that, that the grave was desecrated. Um, it was clearly not her, I, at least in my opinion. I think it was the cult. Yeah. Um, and at this point, too, it's important to know that... Because she wouldn't, she wouldn't sleepwalk, dude. Yeah, she wouldn't do that. <laughs> but there's all these little hints. Again, like, the room to the grandma's... Um, or the door to the grandma's room was open earlier yeah. in the movie. No one knew why it was open. Um, at this point, that's probably because they the cult went into the room. The cult was the one watching everybody go to bed, 
when we saw the the breath, you know, uh, uh, by the treehouse. Yeah. There's all these different things that the cult was setting this up. They put the uh, the body in the attic, and no one else knew about it. Clearly, Steve didn't because he was like, "What smells?" So it had been months mm-hmm. since this happened. Um, so you start to see all these things starting to play into into play into it. And so he comes down, but she at this point is saying she thinks that the everything is is because of the seance. She's like, "We we invited something into the house. There's some sort of spirit in this house." And the only way of protecting Peter is by burning this book. Mm -hmm. But if we burn the book, it'll burn me because I'm connected to it. But I'm willing to make this sacrifice because I want to protect my child. Yeah. And she's losing. She's she's having this this breakdown. She's basically saying goodbye to her husband. Yeah. Saying, you've got to throw this in the fire because if you don't, Peter's going to die. And you have to. And that's going to kill me. And so he's he's just like confused. But eventually it seems like he's going to do it just to appease her whether or not he believes it. Uh, and then for me, what I thought at this point in the movie, I thought that she had been possessed and she was still possessed and that she was doing this knowing that whoever was trying to burn the book would die. Yeah. So when he put it in there, he would catch on fire. And I was like, oh, then she's going to start like laughing and then go kill Peter or something. Yeah. Um, that, that violent outburst that Peter had was, I guess you could see that as the demon kind of leaving yeah. him. Just yeah. Just being like, okay. We're going to have to find an alternative route to get to this. Yes. Because you're still resisting. Yep. And so, and who's the most fragile person in the house? Exactly. So that was that's what I was thinking. I was along yeah. those lines. Um, he goes, Steve goes to do it, and he turns around. He's like, I can't. I'm not done. I'm done with this. This is I'm bullshit. Not, yeah. yeah. So she grabs it, and it's like, fine. She's, she's going to kill herself. She's going to take it and throw it in. And immediately, Steve catches on fire. That I didn't understand why he was the one who caught on fire, mm-hmm. other than the fact that it was just the demon maybe messing with him well i mean the demon's not gonna harm the host that he's in yeah so um so yeah and and as she's freaking out she's screaming and then like has this like chill come over her and then she's got this sinister look on her face so it's clear to us um that she is now repossessed or possessed again um possessed for the first time whatever it is she is no longer in her right mind even though they don't mention it or there's the visual aspect to it Mm mm-hmm didn't you kind of get the feeling that in the background somewhere with lurking was the grandmother? I thought she was there. I think she probably had a lot more to do with it. Yeah. Um, yeah she because... was just like kind of doing everything. Uh, I just felt like she was, she wasn't really mentioned. She wasn't really seen except for that one shot earlier in the film. But I always got this sense that, that her and that demon were kind of the ones facilitating yeah. everything. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, and, and we, we don't see the grandma anymore. No. We, well, we do. We see her one more time. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, no, we see her twice, actually. Anyways. Um, but, so Peter wakes up, because he's been, like we said, he's knocked out. He it's is out. time now. He, it, and he wakes up, and he looks over, and he sees that there's a fire or something, some light in the treehouse. Okay. So did you notice this? So whenever the mom would sleep in the treehouse... They had a heater in there, mm-hmm. and the heater was this really Santa Claus red, yeah, very bright glow red. that yep. was coming out the window. Very visually, very pretty yes. shot. Um, but it had this very Santa Claus red glow coming mm-hmm. from the space heater. This time, Peter wakes up, and it looks it is that yellowy, it's like an orange, orange yeah. fire glow that you get from a, a from a fire or candles. Mm-hmm. And he can you can tell that he's a little like that's different, yeah. Because um, he would, he there's a couple of times in the film where he would wake up and you know saw his mom that was sleeping mm-hmm. out in the treehouse because it would be this really bright red glow coming from the treehouse. Yeah, the heater's on, and it was different. Um, and you caught it. I saw you say something about it, but I also did. Um, as soon as we see Peter wake up and he starts to like sit up in bed, you see something. Well, before that, you had oh, that's he, right. He had he wakes up. What he sees when he wakes up is Charlie. Yes. Is in the corner, and he's like, he doesn't know if he's dreaming yet mm-hmm. or if quite, quite what he's seeing. Yep. And he says, Charlie? And then Charlie just kind of looks at him, and then you can see the head just kind of yeah, lean forward. Lean forward and fall off, and then the head turns into a very nice shot because you don't see the head hit the floor. Mm-hmm. You see a ball yeah. roll towards him. Yeah, and, and then he starts, um, he starts screaming, doesn't he? Yeah. And the mom's in there saying, hey, hey, what's the matter? What's the matter? Um, and she's like, you were screaming. And what what happened after that? I can't remember. 
Um, I can't remember what happened. I between think that's there. where you go into the, what the next shot you were going to talk about. Yeah, because he because he leans up and oh no, it's the um, he wakes up because he the, um, he the head rolls and then he flies backward. He's, yeah, he thinks his grabbing, mom yeah. something is grabbing him. But here's the weird thing: is his bed is up against a wall, but there are hands coming through the, the posts yeah. um, on the headboard and and are just choking him. So he's like, "Mom, you were you were trying to kill me. You were trying, you know, like." Why would you do that? And she's like, "No, you can't. You can't tell your father. We got things off. That scene happened earlier. Yeah. That's why. Because I was like, wait, that didn't happen. So no. Um, so the scene we're talking about. Sorry, guys. Um, is that this uh, again? Saying, this movie is very dense. There's yeah. a lot of layers to it. So when Peter sees Charlie's head roll the ball and sees that he's getting choked, um, it actually happened uh, before. Right before, for the first time, Annie went to burn the book. She's like, I know how to fix this, but you can't tell your father what you just told me. So that's when she goes to do that. When he he uh, wakes up from getting his nose broke, he that is when he sees the glow. And he sits up and he starts, he calls out, Mom, Dad, like, is anybody home? And that's when you see in the corner of the room this, like, figure that is, like, scrunched up. Like, basically, Half, if you It's were, almost like the way you saw the grandmother. Yep. You can half see it and half out see the outline of the figure. And at one point, then the lights, like the the sensor, motion sensor lights come on out right outside his window. And that's when you really get to see it. If you hadn't seen it before, that was yeah. like his the director's way of saying like, those of you who caught it, good job. But if those of you didn't, it's the mother is up in the corner of the yeah. room, literally like floating. And I love the next shot. Oh, so the next creepy. shot kind of comes back down to Peter's level. Yep. You're not, it's not pointing up. It kind of comes back down. So almost it's like you can see Peter, but the background's a bit blurry. Mm-hmm. And as you see Peter kind of getting himself ready to get up, you see the mom just do this real it's exorcism. Like floating crawl. Floating crawl across the wall out the door. It's bizarre. Uh, it's it was absolutely it was creepy. Creepy. And that's when you he can't looks make up out to a lot the of detail, But you knew that was her because yeah. it's, yeah. And that's it's as he's doing that, he's like trying to decide. He feels like he's being watched, and he like gathers himself to look behind him. There's nothing there, yeah. Because as he's gathering himself, the mom does that crawl outside. Um, so he goes outside and he's calling to see if anybody's home. Um, and he closes a door. He's kind of frightened. He closes the door, um, and then he starts walking downstairs. And he, you hear this crackle, like uh, like the the fireplace is yeah. starting to die down. Either that or it was the dad. Yeah. <laughs> and he comes down and he goes and he sees his dad. And um, as he is looking down at his father, this charred body, you see in the corner again of this raised ceiling, the mom is there. Mm-hmm. And you hear like a creak, like either the someone is in the room with him has just taken a step, which we find out someone was. You look across, uh, he turns around, and... It's that weird... It's the guy that was smiling at Charlie at the funeral. Mm -hmm. I thought that she was seeing things, and that was actually Paymon. Because that was the first time we see anybody. The one of many nude people that we see toward the end of the movie. Um, This guy is standing there in the doorway, very much again, like the grandma, almost an apparition. You can see him, you can see that he's nude, you can see the smile... But you can't tell the details. Yeah, and if you have any standards for your nude quality in films, this is not the film because there are a lot of older. Oh yeah. Um, not recently been to the gym nude people uh, in this film. Exactly. Um, not every little bit detail is shown, but mm-hmm. it's it's there. Yes, it, and it's it's to the point where you're you are aware of what's going on. You're uncomfortable because of what you're seeing. Um, and he goes and looks up in the corner and he sees nothing after he looks at this person. And then all of a sudden he starts to like back up a little bit, like he's going to leave. And out of the other corner of the room, kind of exact opposite caddy corner to where she was uh, on the top of the ceiling behind him. Now she's on the bottom of the uh, room in the opposite corner and she starts running at him. Annie does. And he runs away from her. Um, he climbs up the, st- the st- uh, step ladder to up into the attic, slams it behind him, and the mom is pounding and pounding and pounding with her head with her head that on was a the ceiling. Very violent shot. Oh my god, that was cr- that was scary. That I mean, was she, it was just relentless pounding the head into the ceiling mm-hmm. door or the attic door. Yeah, and she is on the ceiling, like crawling yeah. on the ceiling of she this is hallway. Spidered. 
yep. the ceiling and trying to get in every which way and just pounding him, relentless pounding overhead to it. Which again, if you're if you're not, I guess, hit to it, this should tell you by now that okay, this demon has control of her. Yeah, she. Well, yeah, the floating alone yeah. would have done that. Well, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the head banging up against it. He starts to. Uh, Peter is up there and he starts to. He, the, it, the pounding stops. He starts to pull away, and he notices there's a lot of candles lit in this mm-hmm. attic. Um, and he goes over to where the candles are laid out, and he sees where the body was, the grandmother's yeah. body. There's just an outline there now. There's, yeah, outlining candles, and where the body was, you see, like, um, there's a picture of him with the eyes scratched out. Yeah. But also, too, there's, like, where dust had settled, it was like the body was recently moved because yeah. there's a, this outline of no dust. Which, just to show you, just to tell you the detail of this, they still, because, you know, some movies lack detail. Mm-hmm. Um, there was still, the, the outline of the body was still there, yet the outline of the body stopped where the head was not there anymore. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I, I, I yep. as somebody enjoys horror movies, I appreciate the detail. It was, it was cool. Uh, and so, yeah, then he he starts hearing this scratching sound. Um, and he turns around and looks up, and we don't see it immediately. We see him like ha- coming to this very startling um, but slow realization of what he's looking up at. And he looks up, and you see, and it, it is kind of unclear, at least initially. Um, how, but it, Annie is up there, and she's moving her hands back and forth, essentially at the, all the, way at the, at the, the very peak top. top of the ceiling. And she's moving herself back and forth, her hands, um, and she's cutting her head off. With some type of wire yeah. device. And she is just going back and forth, and there's blood dripping down onto the floor. And she has not I don't, not a lot of emotional things going on. She is just hacking away yep. at her neck. And at this point, then, you see um, she's getting faster and faster, basically trying to cut through the last bit of neck left and you hear something um that that is coming from the attic as well and he looks down and he sees three naked people who are almost like smiling and waving at him um and at this point the sight of the naked people uh as well as his mother decapitating herself drives him to jump out the window in the air while floating in the air um jump out the window and it's kind of at this point where you start to um see okay he well he's jumped out of the second story window um, about third story, the attic, and he's landed in the ground on the ground, presumably dead. Uh, and you see the um, a dark shadow. Well, yeah, yeah. The, a, a, well, first you see the light come up, and the light starts to go into him, um, and it it goes onto his back and then dissipates like it entered through him. And then you see this shadow come over him, and he he turns his head and he looks up, and you see the floating body of his mother, headless, headless at this point. <laughs> Floating across the field, across the part of the driveway. And then like straight up into the yep. clubhouse. Oh, that was, that was kind of funny, but also at the same time very disturbing. But it didn't look bad. No, like, it, it, it was, was funny it because was you just like, had this floating body that it was just weird. Because some of that stuff can, with CGI, can look kind of crappy. It looked like they had a body floating across. I mean, it oh, yeah. Legitimate. It was really very realistic. Um, you probably thought this is a hell of a time to quit smoking pot. I know. <laughs> like, well, and see, at this point, too, I kind of felt that it was still Peter because he looked very confused. Yeah. Um, he was like, what is going on? And he stands and he starts walking toward the treehouse. And as he's walking, you he looks around and he sees more naked people watching him. He climbs up into the treehouse um, and you see people that are on their hands and knees like bowing. Um, at the entrance of where the, they come up into the A whole the bunch house. more candles lit, uh, a lot more naked people, and some clothed people in yep. there. We find Jones there. Jones um, there. We see somebody who is wearing a robe with long hair, and it ends up being Jones. Jones there. There's a handful of other people. Um, and as, as Peter gets up here, um, he looks around, and he notices a few things. There's, there's two or three really specific things that stand out here. Um, there are two prone... Uh, decapitated heads bowing in front of a statue. The two heads are of his grandmother and, or the two um, bodies bodies are of the grandmother and his mother. Um, and the the statue in which they are bowing to is the a wooden bodied statue with the head crowned head of Charlie. Um, and one thing that I noticed the the scepter of this um, this 
this statue statue is got that 90 degree wrist looking um pose that peter had been struck with in his classroom did you catch that so when peter has his yes, hand up in the, the air yeah. with his hand at a 90 degree angle to his his forearm it's very rigid it's like this like and didn't i feel like we kind of saw that pose in the books that she was looking through her mom's yeah i think so i think it was this, like the collection. scepter that he was holding there, so it was almost like they were forcing this idea yeah. into him into the classroom yeah because yeah because she was going through her mom's stuff and she had found where it talked about the demon Mm -hmm. And I felt like there was a couple of pictures that she quickly flipped through. And I feel like one of those was the pose. It seemed like it. Yeah. Um, it was, it was just weird. Um, so, and then the last thing you see is you look up at the, the wall and on the wall is a picture of the grandmother and it says queen Ellen. Mm -hmm. Um, so Joan comes around and Joan is talking and she's crowned, she crowns Peter and she makes two specific references saying, um, Speaking to Peter as both Charlie and uh, Paimon, uh-huh. and saying that we um, we rid your we rid you of your female body, and um, now we, give you this we male bless body. you with this male body. So kind of saying that Paimon had been in Charlie and is now in Peter. He can now rightfully take his form mm-hmm. as a male. And it ends, the movie ends with this kind of Peter being crowned, at least the body of Peter, being crowned, looking around, not really sure what's going on, very confused, um, and all of these people bowing and saying, all hail Paymon, and this like chanting ritual, demonic ritual, and a very quick, sharp um, shift, uh, a scene where you just see this sequence that we've seen, but in the form of a doll, or a little model, a little diorama, Mm -hmm. and then it goes to end. Um, and that is it. <laughs> and it's it's very confusing as to what really happened. Um, my thoughts or my question to you would be this: uh, What did happen at the end? Like, what what is the ending of the movie? What who is there? What is there? You know, other than the fact that you do have this cult who has done all this, you know, what is the answer of what happened in this you know, movie? The what kept, especially towards the end there, what kept popping in my head was paranormal activity. It felt like it. And this whole idea of having children, raising a child for some type of cult, demonic possession. Mm-hmm. It felt, yeah. And, and and that's what ended up happening. If you haven't seen Paranormal Activity by now, it's your fault. Um, yeah. But that's basically the, the the summary of Paranormal Activity is is having a, a demon inhabit somebody's body. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, once again, the grandma in that movie, too, was turned out to be a cult figure. Mm-hmm. Um it's always the grandma. It's always the grandmas. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, it's. But so I, I, I very feel much like, like that. I feel like at the end of this movie that that when you when he falls out the he throws himself out the window and that light comes in. I feel like that that is it. He has died. His spirit has gone. Yeah. This is the opportunity that the, the demon was looking forward to inhabit the body. Mm-hmm. Um, and you don't got any limbs blown off or decapitated. Uh, cause I feel like the decapitation was the way to rid yourself. Yeah. Um, it, it happened with Charlie. It happened with mom. Um, and so he is now alive within, uh, Peter and this is his coronation and this is him. I, I, I know you said he still, he still had this, uh, puzzled look on his face. Mm-hmm. I think it's him inhabiting a body yeah. and him just being like, I'm here. Uh, I, Peter's gone. I think it was all this false reality of a cult. I think, um, I think that, and 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 this this is a reach, but for me, um, everything that was going on to everybody, um, I believe, was mentally. I, I they they mentioned that the entire family went had all these schizophrenic issues. If that's the case. Peter's also going through some schizophrenic issues. Yeah, it's, it can, hence the name hereditary. Yeah. So you have this idea that everything's passed on. So I think that Peter himself, um, he may have, he may specifically just have been somebody who's going through all of this. But the fact that the cult was involved, I think that the cult killed his mother, killed his grand, well, the grandma was part of it, was one of the, the ringleaders, I guess. Um, I think the the trauma of him killing his sister accidentally 
built in with all this is that what we were seeing we were seeing schizophrenic hallucinations of peter and by the end he finally got away from it and when he woke up he actually woke up and was not he's still himself but essentially all of this is just peter dealing with the fact that he killed his sister his grandma dying was normal she was old she had, she was dying of old age yeah so everything and, that happened after that was yeah so i think essentially it was uh, a, a screwed up family story in which you'd have this passing down of a of a mental illness and you eventually come to this conclusion that none of what actually happened because all of, look at all the things that happened all these horrible things that happened outside of steve Everything is through Peter's eyes. All the bad things that happen. The mom killing, killing herself. Well, the, the, yeah, because he sees his mom. He's the one who sees the mom. He doesn't see Steve get burned alive. So that'd be the only thing that was that would be out of the, the this specific scenario. Yeah. That this, scenario, this kind of simulation of everything, it doesn't fit there. But everything else, Peter's the one who ex- experiences everything. Peter's the one who sees... Um, I mean, he's the one who, who is in the car with his sister. He's the one who goes through everything. The The only other question with that would be, what about the seance? Mm. But again, his mom would have suffered from it as well. And she's the one that introduced that to him. So, demonic possession and all these things, potentially. But it really so, could just so be you're, you're demon worshippers mel- You're coming from a medical background. Like, this yeah, is purely I th- I uh, think, psychological, mental disorders. yes. That has evolved into something way more extreme. Because for me, I think that the the title of the film Hereditary means way more than just being part of a family that is is going through this. It's a passing on of something. Because a lot of mental disorders can genetically be passed down Mm -hmm. through your genes. Absolutely. People worry about that often. So I really think that Peter is also suffering from a lot of the same things that his mom and his grandma um, and the rest of his family suffered from and the grandma, the cult aspect of it and the paranormal aspect of it, I think almost cheapen the scary elements of the film. In my opinion, I really, I hope that's where it came from. Yeah. If it's not, Oh, well, it still is an awesome movie. And you know, the cult and the demonic possession and the paranormal, all of those things still make it a really, really well done movie. But I think that if you make it all actually just happening in someone's head, as the sleepwalking hallucinations are, um, as all these things that we clearly see aren't really there, if there's a layer on top of that as we're seeing some of these hallucinations break, but not all of them, I think it's even more disturbing because it's what people with these diseases actually see. So I'm going to go in the opposite way of you and say that it's uh, that the whole mental illness thing was bullshit and that this was a demonic cult thing going on and that the grandma's way of saying, yeah, your, your brother killed himself because he was schizophrenic and your dad killed himself because he was bipolar and not, you know, I have DID and, mm-hmm. and stuff like that was just excuses for the demonic satanic cult, uh, doings of the grandmother and it's just the way so if the grandmother was trying to pass that demon on into her own son and yeah it didn't work or he resisted or whatever then how do you ex- you don't go as well listen sweetie i i try to get a demon into your brother and he just was resisting so he you know he was mentally ill and he killed himself so yeah which i, I which too. i don't remember or not was he decapitated also um, I don't think so, but he hung himself. He hung himself. So I, and I think, so I, you know, and I teach psychology in, in, in school, so yeah. I, I'm well versed in mental disorders, but I just, I, I kind of came away with the feeling that it was all bull and that, that, that was just a, a realistic way to explain, uh, the doings of the grandmother. Cause it all goes back to the grandmother and, yeah. and that note that she put in the, that she found at the beginning of the film saying, look, they're the sacrifices will eventually outweigh or the rewards will outweigh the sacrifices uh, it's going to be tough and i'm sorry and, and all that stuff yeah she this is a plot you know this is a plot the scary thing is is we don't have an answer no we don't <laughs> we don't have that's any literally answer. where the movie ends um yeah so that's, but i do that's give cool. credit to what you're saying because they're at the end of it they're very vague mm-hmm. to who's in charge of peter is it peter or the demon 
And it's very vague, so I, I'm not at all discrediting the, your theory because I, it may, as you were saying it, it was like, well, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Because it's easy just to throw around people's history like, oh, yeah, your dad was bipolar and he starred himself. Yeah. What if he was involved in part of that? What if he was a sacrifice? What if he... I don't know, there, there was a very vague in, vague ending to, to, to the film. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at some... Um, I'm seeing because I want to see if there is anything here. There's a Variety.com interview with the director. And he says... Um, it is, as Annie talks about how her mother got her hooks into Charlie at an early age. Are we meant to think Charlie is in on it? And this is a director interview. He says, Charlie is the first successful host for Paymon. It's transferred from Charlie to Peter at the end. So my my theories are debunked immediately. Um, but it says, is there ever a Charlie or is she Paymon from the moment she's born? From the moment she's born, there's a girl, but it was displaced. She was displaced from the very beginning. Um, so Charlie is not ever Charlie. There is no Charlie. There is Paymon and Paymon abiding his time. Yep, and Paymon um, basically decapitated himself um, through Charlie, basically because there's your symbol on the pole. They yeah. put the, the the cult put this dead animal on the road, and uh, so, that's why potentially it so took. So how longer. did they know that he was going to take her to that party, or the party was? I don't know if they knew they were going to take to the party, but the fact that well, they got to go down this route anyway. Yep. To get back. And if by eating the cake without questioning it, knows that there's, maybe there's knows there's nuts in it or just continues to eat, um, takes a little bit longer. Um, hmm. Yeah, so these, 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 basically all these figurines are shrined to himself, to Paymon and all this. Um, yeah. There, and it says, if you look at the diorama, which, you'll see that they're headless figures bowing to a pigeon-headed creature with a crown on its head. Which makes sense to why she would cut off that pigeon's head. Yep. She's... So what we were what we were chalking up to maybe autism or Asperger's is actually a demon possession. Yeah. Wow. We're jerks. We're we're <laughs> shitty teachers. <laughs> um, yeah. It's it's this concept of free will is discussed. Are you saying this family has no free will? They have no free will. Everything is going to happen. Um, this is going to. Well, she said that. She said we're cursed. We have been put. Yeah. We have been cursed upon, uh, and all this stuff is happening. Again, going back to the mother. Yeah. Or, I'm sorry, grandmother. Yeah. And it's it's this idea that um, it, it's Peter by the end who's very much in a weird situation by the end because he now is not Peter. So, yeah. So, I, was it Peter? It was Peter all along. It was always Peter. Peter. Was the goal. It was always Peter. Peter was the goal uh, because if had, had uh, there been a... Uh, Basically, what they did is got their uh, the grandmother, whatever the the child was inside Annie, that became possessed by Paymon. That's why Grandma wanted it to be a boy. Yeah. So that's why Grandma wanted so much to be close to, um, to Charlie is because you treat her like a boy. Yes, because she was trying to see if it would work, or at least trying to get her to a certain age. Because you know, if you caught in that one scene, the the mother was trying to comfort Charlie and saying, "Well, you know, I grew up." being a tomboy too because mm-hmm. the mom like, wanted i didn't like wearing dresses yep. so it's it's almost like this constant uh attempt by the grandmother to pass along this demon into some type of host pretty messed up all right so we're, we are now we're wrapped up here let's uh let's get some final thoughts and uh our ranking let's go this week uh pigeon heads pigeon heads <laughs> The so Captain. one out of five, one two five, um, naked naked cult followers is the one Ooh, that I originally I thought like of, which is too. funny. Let's but go naked cult. We might we might get some weird yeah. things. A decapitated pigeon head's pretty finite. I don't know if we can really put that one in in halves. Um, and if we try to have a naked cult follower, it might be awkward. So let's go with the pigeon heads. Okay. Um, so final thoughts and your uh, your ranking out of five. Uh, I like this movie. There's a lot of hype to it. Um, a lot of build up to it. A lot of people on the internet saying that this was our generation's exorcism. I don't think it's quite there. Uh, we were talking earlier. I see this in the, the different lights of like Rosemary's Baby mm-hmm. or especially The Omen. Um, it, it's not our generation's exorcism, but it is a really good movie. Yeah. Um, it is refreshing to see a movie like this. Um, it's It just had so many elements. It was this such a suspenseful buildup 
that was constant. There was mm-hmm. this constant dread throughout the whole movie that something was going to happen. I don't ever felt like there was a law in the movie. It was just one thing after another that was just this build up, this build up to, to, to the end product. And this is the way horror movies should be. Yep. Um, you don't need jump scares. You don't need fantastic special effects. This is was this had me on the edge of my seat throughout the whole thing. Yeah. And you know, be nice to your family members because right? you never know which one's going to be in a demonic cult. Your thoughts? I give it five out of five pigeon heads. Five pigeon heads. I give it five. I mean, this it's been a long. I think the last movie I felt like this was Babadook. Yeah, Babadook. Babadook is good. Which I was like, wow, this is original. This is good. Um, there's a lot of things you didn't see coming. They built suspense up. So if I'm relating it to something current, it's the Babadook. Um, I saw some people online relating it to the witch. I didn't really find the witch that compelling. Yeah, uh, but it was it's it's good. Yeah, I'm I'm giving it five out of five as well. Uh, it's probably the most uh, intense, thrilling horror movie I've seen in a long time. Oh, yeah. um, it's unique to the extent of having a new story. Um, it does play off conventions that you're familiar with, so it's not completely new. Um, like you had mentioned, it's like Rosemary's Baby kind of a feeling to it in some ways, um, you know, with the child and the cult and all that aspect. But it is new enough that you the the special effects, the you know whether it was CGI or whatever it was, they even the way they very shot realistic. It. There were a lot of specific scenes of of just camera angles that made you feel uncomfortable, like ex- you were expecting something to scare you. And the anticipation of a scare is so much worse than the actual jump scare. It always is. If you've got that building up tension of that slow violin um, or whatever the you know, instrument is, and then you, you have something jump at the very yeah. end, you are scared for half a second at the yeah. jump scare. You're, you, at the buildup gets you scared for 20 seconds. I would trade 20 jump scares in a movie for one. I didn't see that shit coming. Mm-hmm. And I felt like that, and I kind of looked at you, and I kind of looked at my wife when we saw that when Charlie was decapitated. Oh, yeah, we were like, oh, I did not expect that. Yeah, you're right. It, it takes you 20 seconds to get over that jump scare, whereas if for like two minutes you're sitting there trying, holy mm-hmm. shit, that girl was just decapitated. Yeah, and I feel like this this movie was one long buildup of that, that long violin before a jump scare. The you know the the first thing that I saw about this movie when it first came out was the the heart rate challenge where they put like twenty or a hundred different people on heart rate monitors to see what happened mm-hmm. and there were three major spikes. This movie had three spikes in a two hour horror movie, which shows you that those three moments, which I believe were uh, the decapitation of Charlie, um, the um, the sequence of the the seance. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the final scene him where him up. him waking up and that those were your three big moments. Two hours is a long time for a scary movie. Usually yeah. they're a buck twenty. You know you're not getting a two yeah. hour movie out of a horror movie because that's a, that's too much. But the fact that they draw they drew it out they made it longer. Um, ironically enough, if you started watching, um, or I'm looking at our time right now, if you started watching. Uh, hereditary when this this podcast started you would already be done with it because we are a little over two hours and 20 minutes right now um which is kind of funny but just side note i digress um i think it's it's a build it is it was fun it was scary i was very uncomfortable um i was shaking by the end and it could have been a cold theater but i think a little bit of it had to do with i was just uncomfortable many layers too yeah very cool very good movie um go check it out where's this in your top five of is this top five of 21st century horror movies oh easily yes um think about everything that's come out since 2000 well and i, I did do uh, my my second episode of this was a top five scary movies and mine uh, mine are different than most people yeah. um i thought for my my number one's cabin in the woods because i loved the fact that they played on the nuances of horror it was fun it scared me it was just it was uncomfortable um, this one easily jumps, and since then, Quiet Place and Hereditary have both come out, and I both put those in my top five for the aspects of the, un- the unique qualities that Quiet Place did, and the continual, like, I, I, I really do feel like this was one long, drawn-out um, scare. It, yeah. it just, it kept you, you never, like, with with a traditional scary movie, you, you get a moment to recover, 
your heart bursts out of its chest, and then you've got another five or ten minutes before they try to get you again. It's like the never-ending click of going up to the top of a roller yes, coaster. You really never felt comfortable. After something scary happened because yeah. you were uncomfortable, you still felt like something else could still jump out. They never gave you the payoff of a jump scare. They never did. And so because of that, you never allowed yourself to back down. Like, you were so... Like, me personally, I was so uptight about wondering when the next thing would come that it very rarely came but it was all still very well done to the point that by the end i had some sort of a conclusion and then go away from or to take from it and and just just i hope this shows like future directors that you don't need to do that like exactly this this is to make an effective horror film thriller whatever you want to call it you don't have to have jump scares in there you could it could just be like you said one long drawn out scare exactly so um all right well i think that kind of wraps it up for us um thanks for i mean again ben thanks for coming on it was a pleasure we'll be talking again here shortly soon with uh bringing back uh top rope wrestling and uh, i'm excited to get back onto that it's been we've missed a few pay-per-views to say the least so we'll be jumping on money in the bank here uh, in about a week this sunday this sunday i'm excited for it so yeah so tonight's the go home raw yep and then money in the bank yep so if you guys uh are are listening to this um on thursday uh check back in a week for the next episode of the drive-in which is going to be um the incredibles 2 that comes out this week and so uh, my wife jordan will be on uh talking about that with me and so and also next week we will be coming back with our um our return of top rope wrestling so we'll be uh hitting you double action again here hopefully um and we'll be getting back on track with that so thanks for uh for sticking with us in this uh longer episode of the drive-in hopefully uh it was enjoyable for you guys if you have any questions you want to reach out you can always do that through twitter at drive-in eventide um, or you can reach out to me and email me on uh at or just drive in eventide at gmail.com um until next time guys thanks for uh for listening ben thanks for coming on no problem it's been fun and drive home safe